Well, hello and welcome to the Dare to Differentiate show live. The purpose of the show is to empower you to own your voice, value, and visibility so that you shine and thrive. Whether you're tuning in live or watching the replay, I am so delighted that you're here. Let me know in the comment where you are from. I see someone, for, uh, Shirley from Taipei, Miguel from Spain. Welcome, my friend Jennifer is here as well. Let me know whether this is your first time catching the show, if you are a type in first time. If you've been catching my shows for quite some time, type in big fan. I am so delighted to have you guys here today. So I'm your host, Diana YK Chan, founder of My Markability, where I help you stand out, get hired, and earn more. As a seasoned career coach, as a seasoned career coach and a professional branding marketer, I work with ambitious professionals, leaders, and executives or who are in career transition and need help with amplifying their markability, visibility, and credibility. This year, I'm celebrating my 10 year in business, and I'm so honored and um, that I have um, that I've been able to work with thousands of people globally. Uh, recently, one of my proud wins was one of my repeat clients who I worked with almost 10 years ago. She hired me back again to help her reach this next level director level role that she landed. It was a brand new role, and she increased her salary by 55 percent, making close to six figures more. Super proud of her. And when she first reached out to me, she wasn't in a positive state. She was burnt out from work and she wasn't sure what to do. And something I want to share with you guys, you know, because we're still in a pandemic for like the, uh, this whole year now, if you're feeling stressed or burnt out, tired, make sure to take time for yourself. Take time to make space, create that space so that you can process your emotions, so that you can figure out what's next there. OK, so in honor of Asian Heritage Month, I decided to dedicate this month on amplifying Asian voices. So I decided to interview 19 Asian speakers this month. And today we have six amazing speakers lined up. So every Friday this month at 12 p.m. Eastern or 9 a.m. Pacific time, I'll be having a 25 minute fireside chat to talk to these speakers about their cultural upbringing, career journey and career advice. So if you want to learn more about the speakers this month, feel free to check out my website at mymarkability.com forward slash events. Okay, so let me see who is in the house here. We have, oh, wow, from India as well. Wow, amazing. Big fan. Thank you, Jennifer. Amazing. Uh, Huma from Illinois. Welcome back. Thank you. Great to see you again. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. So um, some logistics before I interview my first speaker is that replays will be available. You can go check out on my YouTube channel. After the show, I will add timestamps and the interview questions for easy viewing as well. And I wanna encourage you guys, I'd like to make it as interactive as possible as well. So uh, feel free to click like, give us an emoji, comment anytime in the chat room as well. Share your thoughts, your key learnings, and any questions that you have. I have my friend Simrat, who's backstage, who's also supporting me and moderating the chat room for the first half of the show. So type in go Simrat as well. Okay. The other thing, if you know you are you've been into my show, I love to raise the vibrational energy up as well. Okay, show your appreciation to our guest speaker. Share your kind words um, to show your support as well. Some of my speakers, this is the first time coming on live there, so we want to make sure we gave that um, support there. So type in, for example, our first speaker who's already backstage, Esther Park. Type in hashtag Go Esther, and then we have our next speaker and Angie. Type in Go Angie, Go Tanya, Go Cindy, Go John, Go Sai. These are all the amazing speakers today. Okay, so let's start raising that vibrational energy up there. Okay, so are you guys ready for our first speaker? So our first speaker today is Esther Park. Let me introduce it to her and I'm going to bring her on stage here. So Esther Park is VP of Business Operations at Ledin, a financial services company creating valuable products that disrupt the way people save and borrow using digital assets. Prior to Ledin, Esther worked in various roles that spanned both the private and nonprofit sectors. Her progressive perspective and operational expertise is drawn from her experiences at Drop, Conagra Foods, and World Vision, where she took on key roles, including general manager, chief of staff, and several positions in marketing. She is a mother of two incredible children and has a personal mission to be part of companies that positively impact society. Are you guys ready to welcome Esther to stage? Let's give her a round of applause or say, go Esther. Let's welcome her on stage here. 
Hi, Esther. Hello, hello. Hi. Welcome, welcome. I was just gonna say, like, we we um we both graduated from the same school at Ivy, and both are undergrads and MBAs. And when we were talking backstage, we discovered that we have some mutual connections, and I'm so glad that we're finally uh, connecting here today. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. This is great, great opportunity. Yeah. So thank you. And I know you're gonna do great. I want to give you this affirmation that you're gonna be <laughs> amazing. I know that your friends gonna watch and say that you're gonna be amazing here. <laughs> so I'm gonna kick things off with some rapid fire questions. This is to warm up here, and then we'll dive uh, go into your career uh, journey there. So. Why don't we start with um, what's one thing most people don't know about you? Um, I'm incredibly nervous and terrible at presentation. So I'm putting it out there because, you know, we're talking about authenticity and being yourself. Yeah. And so that would be it right now. I'm just I'm, I'm nervous and terrible, Aww. like ter terribly um, nervous about presenting. And, and so here I am Aww. trying to push myself out of comfort pushing out of your comfort zone <laughs> guys let's give some like positivity in the chat room please let's raise it up for us right here so thank you for being drawn up and cheering because your talk is stop being someone you're not which is all about being yourself so thank you for starting that off there yeah. um what um what's your superpower I, I have a lot of energy and it tends to be infectious. So um, I'm seeing that that's one of your many superpowers too, Diana, but I do have a lot of energy, a lot of passion. Um, and so when I work with people, they they find that really helpful, especially when you know things are a bit challenging in today's world. Um, I do bring people along and, and get people pumped. Amazing, you get people mm -hmm. pumped. That's why we're, we're all excited backstage in these silly places, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Um, what are three words that, um, that others would use to describe you? Three words that others would use to describe me? Um, like extreme growth mindset. Mm. Ooh, extreme yeah. growth mindset. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Extreme growth mindset. We're going <laughs> to dig in further about that later on there. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your cultural branding, up upbringing. If you can tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about that. And what's one cultural value that had an impact on you, good or bad? Yeah, and that's a great question. I did think about this one in regards to just um, what was important. And I think respect for elders is something that we were taught at a young age and and how it transcends into the workplace is like respect for the people who came before you. Um, mm -hmm. So many times you walk into an organization and I recently joined a, the lead in, you come in and you wanna drive impact that you almost forget about all of the work and the effort and the learning and the growth that happened prior to you being there. And so I apply this like um, mindset in everything I do. Um, mm. in, in taking the time and talking to people about what worked, what didn't work, why they're there, and really paying respects and homage to the things that they've done prior to me being there. And it allows me to join them in the journey versus coming in and trying to drive change too quickly or be a bit of a, like, this is how it, it should be done. And I've seen mm -hmm. it um, happen so many times when people do come into companies, they come in and say, this is what we do. This is how we should do it. Um, and not taking the time to really respect those that come before you is, I think, something that has led to a lot of conflicts and challenges um, when people on board. Oh, I love that. Respect those who come before you. That's such a good one. Thank you. Thank you. So what's an, um, one challenge that you encountered in your life or career due to your race? How did that impact you? Yeah, I think um, this notion that I'm a quiet hard worker, like walking into a room, an Asian quiet hard worker. And then when I come in with a, a bit of a contrarian view with a strong voice, people um, that misalignment on expectations and behavior has mm -hmm. uh, led for led to people just concerned about what I'm saying, but not necessarily listening to what I'm saying, because they're just like, Oh, what, what's happening here? Why is this, you know, quiet hard worker having such strong voice and opinions of things that shouldn't shouldn't happen. And so I found that that was one of the things I had to overcome was um, making sure that I understood the context of what their perceptions of me were before walking into a room. But I do find that that's something that's very common um, in, mm -hmm. in its initial interactions with people. Yeah. And and so when this happened to you, I guess, like, did, did it bother you? Or how did you go about, you know, navigating that, like knowing this is like the perception or what they feel about you? 
at first it was more just the lack of being able to influence that was、uh, challenging, right? So why? Why am I continuously being this contrarian voice, and why are people reacting in a way of negativity?、Um, so it was very hard to overcome the lack of impact that I was able to make.、Um, quickly identifying that that was something that was really、uh, misaligned in perceptions versus reality. I think. Knowledge was the first point to then drive the change that I needed to either adapt to myself or be quite honest and say, "Hey,、uh, I'm going to take a a risky bet here, but I find sometimes our conversations are too、um, uh, driven by conflict. And how do we get on the same page?、Um, yeah. And that was helpful by acknowledging the fact that the initial Um, reason for that conflict was that misalignment on who is this person and why is she coming in with such a strong, fiery、uh, voice?、Here. Yeah,、mm-hmm. yeah. What I'm hearing is like seeking to understand as、mm-hmm. well, like to really understand in order to identify ways to to really work well to, together. There, yeah, that's great. So let's talk a little bit more about your career journey.、Um, what's interesting about what you currently do? I know that you recently started your new role. Yeah,、oh, Leden is. Super fascinating. It's a very interesting space, cryptocurrency.、Uh, so what they do is they unlock the power of digital assets. So imagine if you can start earning interest off of your Bitcoin, or you can take out loans against your Bitcoin in order to buy、uh, a house.、Uh, there's so much opportunity when it comes to crypto. And right now,、uh, with cryptocurrency, you have it sitting in an exchange, and it sits there. And yes, it may go up and down depending on what Elon Musk decides to say that day. But there's an opportunity to actually earn interest off of the crypto. It, there's an opportunity for you to take out loans against the crypto.、Um, the other thing that's super fascinating around crypto is that there is just so much potential opportunities for solutions on a global scale. So I know you mentioned like driving impact for society, and I think crypto is、yeah. an opportunity to help emerging markets to really access.、Um, A global currency to help them out of their conditions and the situations that they're dealing with every day, right? If you imagine inflation or access to capital, cryptocurrency has such a use case in all of those, and and being a, a core foundation for driving impact and and change. So that's really exciting、yeah. for me.、Mm-hmm. Wow. So I, I'm really because I'm I'm new to this area, but I, I'm curious more how you made a decision to make this pivot because prior to that, you didn't you weren't in this industry. Before, right, and I'm guessing because your extreme growth mindset that you decided to take on this challenge and seeing the opportunity. Can we maybe go through a little bit of that? How you decided to to make that pivot or make this change there? Yeah,、um, it's interesting. It's it's part of this journey. I, I started in non for profit, and I will continue to have the desire to drive impact and change in society. Um, and I did in my MBA did a, a paper on microfinance, and so this notion of access to capital being an unlock for people to come out of their situation. So that that's something that's always been on my mind. Now I joined a startup、um, called Drop, and I've been so blessed and fortunate to really experience different parts of an organization and growing and scaling a company.、Um, so that was kind of like another big anchor point in my journey. And as I was thinking about the crypto space and the solutions that crypto will enable, but also just like the opportunity to、um, drive an impact to not or- only the organization because of my experience at Drop, but also to society and the way that you know crypto can be a solution for many,、um, it kind of brought it together. And I、mm-hmm. said, "Hey, let's let's do this."、Uh, the learning too, that growth mindset, like. You know, reading、uh, the Bitcoin white paper like four times and still not really understanding it, but still trying to understand it. Like there is that curiosity and and enabling me to just like dive into topics of and deep understanding of things that I didn't know before.、Um, especially during this time,、um, it's、yeah. been really great, refreshing. Nice. That's great to hear that.、Um, what were the highs and lows in your career journey? What are some of those lessons learned? <sighs> yeah. Hi would definitely be joining startup in the startup world, and I think it's because of who the type of person I am, right? I like to roll up my sleeves and just like learn by doing and、um, be engaged in in connecting with people, but also connecting on challenges and topics. And so that would definitely be something that's a critical anchor to、um, changing my career、uh, trajectory.、Um, mm-hmm. And I think some of the lows would probably be when 
I was doing actions because I had to and not because I should be doing it. So it was more um, whenever I was just like following the um, path that was set out for me. And that is a very personal thing. Some people thrive in those environments. But with me, it was definitely something that was a low because I just found myself not being inspired. And there's a really interesting model. Um, it's called TOMO, Total Motivation. It's about play, potential, and purpose. And if you're not working for those three elements of motivation, um, then you start to look at like things like pay and promotion and other elements that would compensate for not having that play that um, potential and the purpose. And by play, it's not like, hey, I'm like partying all the time or like doing yeah. games, but it's like every day I should want to be at work. That moment where you're like working on a project and time goes by and you're like, oh, I, how did that time go by? Because you just like get so excited about what you're doing. Um, that is so important for me. And so when you do things mm -hmm. that are just like out of requirement, I found that I lost that sense of play and it leaves me very demotivated and frustrated. Oh, I love this. I want to type that in there. Um, the Tomo, right? Like play, purpose, potential. I love that. Like it's evaluating against that of like when I hear those words too, it's like, this is what's going to fill your cup mm -hmm. that you feel, you know, your own purpose, you're doing what you're meant to do and you're having fun doing it as well. It just feels good when I hear that there. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. So let's move on and talking about your topic of stop being someone you're not. Um, how did you find your voice? Can we maybe walk through a little journey of, you know, earlier in your career to where you're now? Like, what were some of those struggles and how you went about finding uh, your voice? Yeah, it's a good question. And why this this topic is so important to me is because the experiences I've had prior, um, you join companies with like this in your mind, you're like, oh, I need to prove myself. So you sit there and you're like, oh, this information or that stat or that fact. And you're trying to use knowledge as a form of influence. Um, and as, as I continue to do that, I actually found my voice more and more, uh, like I, my voice wasn't driving impact. And it was like, oh, that's so weird because that's how they do it, or that's what he did, or that's what, you know. And so I was trying to emulate others that were influential by being like them. Mm. And, and that, that action was actually creating a disingenuous people were just seeing right through it. And so what I was trying to do is like almost prove myself and like constantly be out there um, being a know-it-all almost by trying to prove myself. And then my voice just quieted because people, people saw right through it. And so when I pivoted myself to say, Hey, I'm just going to be my authentic self, ask more questions and be curious, show more vulnerability take risks by saying, hey, this is a risky conversation for me, but I'd like to share X, Y, Z. Um, those types of conversations, and because that genuine, authentic desire was behind it, it just led to so much more impactful and effective communications and levels where I was able to speak to people in and hear back from them. I think people are relational in general. And so when you start to speak at people or try to prove yourself and like try to emulate other people, that disingenuousness, but also that lack of connection uh, doesn't lead to driving the impact and, and the, the strength of your voice as, as when you have those interactions that are, you know, relational yeah. in nature. Yeah, that's amazing. And did you have any like mentor or coaches to guide you through through this or just more like your own having that growth mindset that you decided to to really be yourself and yeah no I have had um there are two three people who have been incredibly impactful over the last few years since I've joined the startup one was a personal coach Susan uh, Huang she has been incredibly valuable to me and she would share with me how important that pivot was and walk me through that journey. So if you have a coach, if you need a coach, I would highly recommend coaches because I do think yeah. that they can pull you out of the weeds and really yep. think through and act on the right um, the right things. Um, I also did a bit of a, a crazy little like LinkedIn, like, hey, uh, send help. Um, outreach to somebody who is senior at Slack in a people operations role. 
Um, and he responded. And so, you know, I actually shared a story like as an Asian, um, this is kind of my upbringing. And so you can understand and connect with that. And he's like, yeah, I totally can. And so since then, he's been a mentor of mine and just constantly shared. He shared with me the Tomo model, but shared with me advice throughout the journey. So um, take some bold moves. People who are in various different senior levels across different companies are still human and they want to connect and help people. And so that's another one that was really important for me. And and my CEO, my current, but also my past CEO, um, they've been very open to allowing me to stretch myself. And so making sure that you're uh, um, on a team and your manager, your leader is just giving you that your platform, that canvas in order to be who you are is critically important. Yeah. Oh my God, this resonates so much. I, I love that you were bold and courageous enough to reach out to people, to share also your struggles so that people can relate to that and be like, hey, it's okay to feel this way. And what can we do about that? And uh, that that's a great, uh, I think a key takeaway there is don't be afraid to reach out uh, for, for help there. So I want to talk a little bit about soft skills, how to develop your soft skills to advance your career. Mm hmm. Um, it's a so, hot topic this year. <laughs> yeah, I think connecting with people, not connecting with ideas and thoughts, but connecting with people for me has been so important. Um, and so a, a couple things, self-awareness, like how, soft skills come when you really are aware of who you are, what your skill sets are, what you're not good at, what your triggers are. Ask yourself like when you start to get irritated and like write it down and have it on a sticky. And so when those moments come up, um, you have a really strong ownership over those emotions without, um, you know, being overcome by them. So really take time to be self-aware. And then it's really um, being able to calibrate yourself based on those moments, whether it be in the trigger points to say like, hey, I really appreciate your honesty here, but I just need a minute before we engage in this topic, allowing you space to react. Um, so once you're self-aware, then you can take the time to regulate yourself on those moments. Um, and, you know, some great advice from my coach was, um, you know, inquiry is always the best way to connect with people and drive um, things forward. And so it, genuine inquiry, not like asking questions mm -hmm. with the answer already behind in your head, but like come with a position of true curiosity in all conversations, because then it leads to collaboration and like actual movement and impact forward. And so um, that's been really helpful for me is to like, come into a meeting with no expectations or intentionally saying, I know I know this stuff, but like, I am not allowed to talk about any of this stuff today. I need to really come to a place where it's a lot of curiosity and interest and wanting to understand. And if I can do that well, then, then I could be even more impactful when I and drive change and drive that, have that conversation. And people are, are there with me versus it being like, hey, by the way, this is how we do things. Like it just, yeah. it doesn't land as well. I love that. I love that. I, I mean, what I'm hearing is that, you know, instead of having this expectation of how things should be, you are coming in from a place of curiosity, mm -hmm. which is something that I, I've learned a lot as a coach as well as always be curious and really have, have that um, authentic inquiry as well, asking, being curious. And that's how you invite that, have that conversation there. Um, mm -hmm. That's great. So I want to talk a little bit about, more about your experience working at startups. Um, how do you navigate and thrive in roles with ambiguous expectations. I'm guessing you've been in a lot of roles that are like brand new. No one's ever been in that role before. How do you go mm -hmm. about navigate, navigating that? And what advice do you have for others to I guess, thrive in a, a new uh, ambiguous type of uh, role? Mm -hmm. um, you need to have a growth mindset. So like you can't, uh, when, when I used to do interviews um, in my role at Drop in a people operations role, and when people were like, well, what's my next role? What's my career progression? What's my path? Um, at least depending on the stage of startup, some of that is really up to you, right? I yeah. can't give you that because it really is up to you and what you want to define yourself and your future to be. Um, and so that ambiguous, like in a very ambiguous um environment you have to have that growth mindset and just being willing to take on all different challenges and like learn and thrive I think the second one is like the ability to put yourself out there and fail and like fail badly and know that that's going to happen and then 
be self-aware and also curious enough to why I failed, what happened and what was part of that journey to fail um, and, and not go after doing what people have done in the past. And, and I've, I've done that so many times. It's like, I do things because it's been templated or because, oh, this company did it, so I'm going to do it. But like pivot that to say, why am I doing it? Is this because that's a big problem here or is it because I'm doing it because everyone else is doing it? And the second it's because everyone else is doing it, it's kind of not the right thing to do. Um, and so really being able to challenge and reflect on that is important, um, especially in the startup world. Um, and the last thing is really being able to right size problems. There were times when I'd had these meetings and I would feel so terrible and it would consume me. And I realized at the end of the day, it was like one bad meeting, no big deal. How come it's taking so much of my mindset and my emotional health? It was like literally one bad conversation and tomorrow's a new day. And so I actually did meditation to like take problems and make them the size that they actually were versus the size that I thought they were. And that practice mm -hmm. of actually putting to the size like, hey, her and I just didn't get along that one minute. No big deal. It doesn't take away from the, you know, four years of relationship that we have. I'm just going to make it the size of the problem and address it head on. And, and that's really important, especially in, in moments of ambiguity, because that that lack of confidence or not sure and uncertainty, if you start to make the problems too big, then it becomes very debilitating to actually drive progress or impact. Oh, such great advice. I love that. Um, I have another question I just thought of because you, you've done interviews as well at startups. What are some of the common mistakes people make that you've seen um, coming into interviews? Uh, what are like your top three mm -hmm. mistakes that you see? Um, when, especially when it comes to startup, people are very mission driven and purpose driven. So if you walk into an interview and you haven't actually tried the product, you don't know what the product is about, what they're trying to deliver on. Um, it just, it, it's it's kind of like the, the thing that's the most important and you're not talking about it. So be, be able to talk to why you love the product may be challenging enough to say like, hey, this is the stuff that I think are biggest problems. Um, but I think that that piece is like something that seems very obvious, but I haven't seen too many people um, kind of just go out of their way to show the passion of why this job is the most important for them. Because the people in that room have been living, breathing and like sweating and fighting hard for that mission and, and purpose. Um, I think the second thing would be, um, just over over communicating like I, mm. I've sat and like tell me about yourself and like 25 minutes later <laughs> I'm like okay that was really interesting thank you um people don't want to know your entire life story just the most important things that matter um and try to you know ensure that you have really good questions so the third one would be like um okay what questions do you have and they're like oh well and it's more canned um type of questions but if you come in with true curiosity like this is you interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you go in with that mindset ask the questions those um those people really stand out for me Mm, I love that. So to wrap things up here, what's your final advice on managing your career? <sighs> yeah, there's um, a lot there. Hold on. Let me think about the most important piece here. Um, I think it's about the journey and not the destination. And especially um, early days of my career, it was all about getting that promotion or getting that whatever it was, that next destination. But if you're in it for the journey, if you're really there with the intention of curiosity and learning and experience, if you're there with your true authentic self as being the core of what you're doing and not that trying to get that promotion because that guy did it or that person did it, um, it just changes the way that you live and how much more satisfied you are with every day that you are um, working at this company and, and you're working so much of your life, you should love it. And you should be there for the journey. And just that, that present should be exciting for you every day, um, versus it being that future destination. So I think that that would be it is like, live in the journey and, and don't yeah. be so fix fixated on the destination. Amazing advice. Oh, my goodness. This was so good. I hope you guys learned so much. Thank you so much for your time and insights. Yeah. Honestly, Esther, you're amazing. You <laughs> really amazing nuggets. 
We'll be sharing this uh, afterwards. We'll be summarizing some key notes here as well. Um, where can people uh, connect with you if they would like to, to connect? Uh, LinkedIn. So my name yeah. Esther Park and I work at Ledin, L-E-D-N dot I-O is uh, the company I work at. So come find me and message me and I'd love to learn about everyone else's story. So that curiosity growth mindset, please come and, and I'd love to do a coffee. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time uh, today. Uh, yes, we've got the key learnings here, right? Key learnings, the Tomo play, purpose, potential, ask for help, uh, reach out as well, uh, learn about why it could fail and, and improve as well. So it's all about the journey, not the destination. Thank you so much for your time today, Esther. Uh, I'm sure I'll be in touch later on with you. <laughs> Sounds good. It was so, so nice. Thank you. It was so good. Take care. Bye now. Bye. Oh my goodness, wasn't that amazing? So we kicked off the first speaker with Esther Park. So next up, we have Angie Minhad Park with us. Angie is a PhD researcher at York University, a diversity and inclusion trainer, and an active community organizer. Angie's doc doctor uh, PhD research focuses on the representation of ethnic Asians in North America in contemporary literature and media. As a consultant at the Humphrey Group, a leadership communication training firm, Angie engages learners from diverse organizations across industries to embrace diversity, inclusion, and equity mindsets and adopt practical communication strategies to allyship. Are you guys ready? Type into the chat room. Go Angie there. Let's welcome her to stage. All right. Hi, Angie. Oh, I can't hear you yet. I think you're muted. No, I can't hear you yet. Let's see. Is your headset connected? If you go check the audio, the little advanced settings, is your audio input to your mic? No. Let's check that again. Uh, Nope, let's see here. You may need to refresh. Um, if you go to the settings, just what you know, see that little settings there? If you check in there, does your audio input connect to your mic? It does. That is so strange. I can't hear you yet. Um, Hold on, is it me? Can you hear Simrat? Simrat, you can hear Angie? Oh, so is it me then? Let's see, can you hear? You cannot hear Angie, I can only hear Diana. Okay, so Angie, what you wanna do is maybe refresh the browser and come back in. We'll try to bring you back in, refresh the browser. Let's see if that will work there. Okay. Okay. So hopefully Angie will join back with us. We had a little bit of audio issues, but go Angie. Yes. We'll give her some love. Sometimes that happens with tech issues, even though we do testing there, but no problem. I'm sure it will work there. Yes. Thank you, Jean. Jean is a mentor to, to Angie. I'm sure it'll be fine. I know sometimes it's stressful when <laughs> we're fixing audio issues. But we had such a great uh, first session there. I hope you guys really uh, enjoyed it with uh, with Esther. We talked so much. I actually learned so much about the Tomo model. I didn't. Uh, I haven't heard about that before. But I'm familiar with the play purpose potential. So that's uh, uh, it was great to hear that from her. So let me see. Angie is back and see if the audio works here. Let's bring her back here. Hi, Angie. Oh no, we can't hear you. Uh-oh. No. Try without the headset. Yeah, let's try without the headset then. Maybe it could be the headset issue that's not connecting right now. Yeah. Could be the headset there. Mm. That is so strange. Uh, without that, no, I can't hear you at all. Um, uh, the volume is already at the highest on my end with your volume there. Um, are you using 
the right browser like Chrome or Firefox, you are? Okay. That is so strange. Um, oh my goodness. What can we do here? If and we tested this out. <laughs> oh tech. <laughs> The only thing I can know is uh, it, it is to restart. Like they usually like restart should should get in uh, there. Like with if you're using Chrome or uh, Firefox. Okay. Yeah, and then, or you have to check your settings on the computer as well. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry guys, we've got some, some tech issues here. Let's hope this we can resolve this. Yeah, on a different device. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay. All right. So we're going to wait a moment there uh, for Angie to come back. Hopefully it works because I really want to hear from her. We're supposed to talk a little bit about um, today and her because she does her, um, I invited her because of her specialty and her studies in Asian studies. So I thought it'd be great to get her insights on that. And she does training in communication as well. So, so hopefully we'll be able to get a moment with her to talk about her experience uh, in that area. Uh, but let me see here. I'm sure she'll be back uh, soon. Oh, there. Let me see. Okay. I know live events can be stressful. Yes. You're okay. Thank you for waiting, Jean. <laughs> I know Angie's insights are worth waiting for. <laughs> yes. We're going to give her love and support. I know it can be stressful. I would be stressed too, uh, as well. Um, but, um, I wasn't going to say, and I knew, and I, uh, you know, did a lot of we did a lot of testing already beforehand as well. Sometimes things happen as well. I actually did a training yesterday for a global insurance company, and I did so much testing a week before, the night before, the day of, and then when I joined, um, my slides were not sharing. My slides were not sharing, and likely I knew it was because it was not compatible with the app that I was using, and I had to open it up in the browser to be able to troubleshoot. Um, but everyone was stressful, so we just have to like you know we'll just chill there and let's see let me just take a look at some uh, comments here um let me see here what do we have from from andrea here so many great nuggets from esther fomo coach and on and on they went yes <laughs> oh great to hear danielle first time here really like it that's great to hear that thank you thank you i'm i have to say guys i've been amazed that i've been there's a lot of you from all over the world that i see like from thailand from spain from india um all over thank you for your support like africa i've seen as well so it's been great to see that the show has been uh, getting a bigger reach around the the globe there so yeah yeah awesome okay let's see if uh esther will be coming back soon there or perhaps we'll do a little bit of storytelling while we're we're waiting i did a post this morning on um I did a post this morning that I received. Oh, let me see. Angie is back. Let's see if she's ready to go here. All right. Okay. Hi, Diana. Can you hear me okay now? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, so we're all like, yay, it's I'm working. I'm so sorry for that. I, I tested the device and everything was working fine, but I don't know what happened today. <laughs> No problem. You're here. Let's all take a deep breath. You're here. I know, but you are here. Welcome, welcome. Jean said it's worth the wait. So it's worth the wait here. Okay. So let's get it. You into groove of things. Let's warm up. Okay. Don't be nervous. Uh, you're here. We have time to cover the questions here. So, so Angie, why don't we first start off with um, what fulfills you? Ooh, that's a great question. I, for me, what fulfills me is any type of self-expression. I love mm. writing, talking to people. I think any any form of being able to express my thoughts really fulfills me. Nice. And what's one thing most people don't know about you? Uh, that I am kind of in between the spectrum of an introvert and an extrovert. So I think most people know me as the one side, uh, but I really, I do feel quite lonely, especially in this environment. I love seeing people, uh, yeah. but the, the other side of me really needs enough time by myself as well. And so I think mm -hmm. I always have to balance. I hear you. I love connecting with people, but after like even the show, I need time to myself. Like I need to just have alone time. So I totally hear you there. So why don't we dive in a bit about your cultural upbringing? Can you tell us a little bit about that? And um, what's one cultural value that had an impact on you, good or bad? Sure. Uh, so one cultural value I think is um, 
when, oh, sorry, my browser shut off for a minute. Okay. <laughs> and um, so I think one cultural value is resilience uh, that I have developed uh, from my experience of moving around different places, not only uh, because of my choices, but because of my family's experience. So I was born uh, in South Korea, and when I was a child, my parents were quite well off. Uh, but then during uh, around 1997, there was a financial crisis in South Korea, and my parents um, did you know nearly lost everything. And so since then, for a few years, we moved around from southern countryside of the country to uh, at some points we were uh, staying in relatives' places. And then we arrived in Canada uh, in mm. 2001. And even then, there, the moving continued because you know they had a language barrier. Uh, they were also looking for opportunities. And so uh, my parents began working right away, transition jobs from my, my dad from uh, truck, long haul truck driving to operating convenience stores, restaurants. Um, and my mom worked in hair salons at certain points. And so um, seeing them uh, you know, go through these transitions has taught me an incredible amount of resilience. Uh, and also mm. optimism and positivity around that as well, that, you know, they've never really complained about this. They've always thought, you know, you, you pick an opportunity and you work hard at it. And, and yeah, and so I think that's been instilled in me. Nice, nice. And what's one challenge um, that you encountered or faced in your life or career due to your race? How did it impact you? Uh, so I think there are many challenges, so it's really hard to pick one. <laughs> uh, but I think maybe in the broader context of things, uh, because uh, we transitioned different neighborhoods. And so first, my parents uh, landed in Toronto. We were living in a neighborhood near Jane and Lawrence. And so the first school I went to um, was filled with mostly uh, Black, Latino, South Asian, uh, white kids. But Asians were still the minority. Uh, and so when especially when I had a language barrier, you know, in the schoolyard, you would get the questions uh, and microaggressions from, you know, are you are you Chinese? Where are you from? Uh, do you eat dog? You know, um, there were all these kinds of microaggressions. But then also um, during my career, I think um, as I was, you know, I, as I became an adult, I thought that these microaggressions or discrimination would have less of an impact on me because I think the negative effect that this had during my youth is that I started brushing off experiences of discrimination as this is normal, this happens all the time, right? But mm -hmm. it did have an impact on my confidence uh, and yet I didn't really realize it. And then one uh, challenge that I encountered during my career is that I pursued my undergrad in English literature studies and then I did my master's. Uh, and when I entered the master's degree, originally I wanted to focus my master's project on the study of Asian Canadian communities and uh, representation. But when I approached a potential supervisor with this project, uh, who was a specialist in this field, I received very well-intentioned advice that I might be pigeonholing myself into this field as an Asian mm -hmm. speaker, and that at a certain point in time, it was the trend that you hire Asian scholars to teach Asian American courses, but this mm -hmm. may not be the case. And so I felt at the time, I think I was naive. I was young and naive. And so I, you know, I, I was discouraged by this and I took up a different project during my master's. But thinking back now, I think no matter the intention behind the advice, this had the impact of putting me in a double bind um, with my mm. ring. And, and also, you know, it points out sy systemic barriers for Asian scholars as well. Uh, and so, you know, at the time, I didn't really realize the full scope of this, uh, but I did pivot. I did do my master's project in Victorian literature instead, British literature. Uh, and then I, come, I came back in my PhD to do my full scope of the project that I wanted on Asian Canadian, Asian American studies. Mm, nice. And what's um, interesting about what you currently do? Uh, so, yes, I think this is a nice segue. Um, yeah. So 
a PhD candidate and my research focuses on uh, the representation of Asian Canadian and Asian American uh, individuals. And this, I, I go through a wide scope of literature, uh, media, including television shows. So Kim's Convenience is definitely a part of my <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, blog articles, uh, YouTube media, uh, rep, uh, animations as well. So that's the, I think the interesting part of uh, what I do that I think people aren't often aware of. You know, when I say mm -hmm. I'm in English literature, or that I study English literature, I think often I get the assumption that I study something classical. Um, mm. so, you know, it's not an immediate jump that, you know, I could be focusing on Asian representation. Um, but I do feel that um, the study of literature is really a study on representation in different kinds of it. And even English, I mean, you and I are speaking English. I, I don't think it's limited to an ethnicity or a culture. It's a global language. And so forms of representation is also expanding as well. And so I, I love that, you know, this is a really interesting part of my work, that there's more possibilities to it than people are aware of. Um, mm. This is what what really keeps me going. <laughs> oh, nice. That's great to hear that. Um, and tie into your career journey and I think pivoting as well. Like what have been your guiding principles in managing and advancing your career? Um, I would say a principle that keeps me going is maybe, you know, two pieces of advice. I think one would be to do it your own way and to trust your gut. Um, because I think even within the scope of doing a PhD project, um, I think there were so many pieces of advice and, you know, you see so many scholars, so many mentors and even your own supervisors, um, you know, you see their work and you feel inspired to go along that way. But I often found that unless it's delving into my own curiosity, I saw Esther earlier talk about, you know, really going deep and digging into your curiosity. And I think that's the case here as well. Like, unless it's an authentic form of, you know, what you are thinking about, what problems you can address. Um, I think, you know, it, 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 I think it's like finding that, I think, way that is authentic to yourself um, is, is a principle. And also to trust my gut because um, sometimes, you know, you may be pursuing that job or that line of work that, you know, pays you the dollars or earns you the respect but maybe yeah. fulfill you in a way that you know it should and so i think that's where i would also advise you know to, to trust your gut as well yeah yeah i love that um and as i can maybe dive in a little bit here around let's just see here yes how can people be more courageous in speaking up about their ambitions and their experiences it ties into this seeking your truth here Right. Yeah. So I, um, I think one strategy that I would advocate is finding the right people. I think finding the right mentors or the support circles around you that you that will encourage you to speak up about your ambitions and experiences because I found this challenging like that you know one well-intentioned uh, well-intentioned mentor I, I mentioned um, but also oftentimes I think. Um, you know, people are worried about their own career paths and their own sense of security and, you know, what's yeah. the right path to go down. And so I think you can easily get wrapped up in this, but you can also find the support circle that's interested in your work, right, and interested in your own creativity. Uh, and so I think for me, uh, it was a learning curve of asking for help and you know approaching different people diverse people outside of my comfort zone in order to find that they're curious about my work and that they want to listen um, and so this has also encouraged me to speak up as well mm, that's great to hear that um, how can people adopt practical communication strategies that uh, toward uh, uh, allyship so i have two pieces of advice for this. So I think um, one would be for, uh, especially nowadays, you know, with Asian Heritage Month, all that's going around with uh, discrimination against Asian individuals and communities. My advice for um, Asian uh, listeners would be to find a comfortable medium for you to speak up. 
So for me, I think, you know, I, I had the opportunity to connect with you, Diana, uh, because you reached out to me after I posted a blog article. Um, yeah. Experience of racism that I had in downtown Toronto very recently. And for me, this took weeks for me to put together this article because inside I was so worried that I would say the wrong thing, that I wouldn't receive support. Maybe I would be instead somehow in my imagination that I would be condemned or ignored for speaking up. Um, and yet the, the blog uh, as a medium was helpful for me because it gave me that time to think, mm -hmm. really put together my story in a way that I wanted versus had someone asked me in a conversation, you know, that may have been more difficult to do. So I think for, you know, each Asian listener, maybe, you know, it is difficult to speak up about experiences that have traumatized us or that have hurt us, um, but maybe finding that like unique way of speaking up, that's, that's the right fit for you. Um, and then also, you know, for non-Asian listeners, I think a communication strategy would be to ask questions without assuming. So I think mm. one, uh, very prevalent microaggression against Asians is this assumption, right? Embedded in the question of where are you from? Assuming that you're an outsider, right? Are you Chinese? Assuming that it's one ethnicity embedded in this race, right? And how mm -hmm. yeah, an incredibly harmful question because it pits Asian individuals against one another. Um, and so not being aware of that kind of assumption or impact and asking questions could also be harmful. So I would mm. encourage, um, you know, non-Asian listeners to to listen really, you know, empathetically and with the intention to listen to stories that are different um, than yours and, and really uh, in order to be an ally, to also speak up for individuals that, you know, are having trouble. Um, yeah. As well. Yeah, yeah. Would you have an example on how to phrase, like instead of saying like, where are you from? Or like asking about their ethnicity, like what's in a better way of asking them, assuming like an example that you can, can give there? That's a great question. I think my advice around that would be to, so this is, you know, personally what I think from my experiences of encountering this question, right? Um, mm -hmm. and so what I often find with this question, for example, where are you from, is that the intention could be innocent. But, mm -hmm. what, you know, what they're not aware of is that, you know, there is the whole context of microaggressions that could be the other side of things, right? And so, um, a strategy would be to embed and communicate the intention um, with clarity because you are, you know, um, I think that's a part of communication, right? So there is a difference between saying, you know, where are you from? And, um, you know, saying, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm an immigrant or I would like to get to know you better. Um, uh, you know, whatever the intention is, um, I, I, mm -hmm. I'm, to hear it, you know, did you grow up in Canada? Did you have any kind of, you know, diverse experiences, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think the context and, you know, how much framing you do behind that question is important. And mm -hmm. some people may say that, you know, this is extra work, but I think it takes that extra work um, to build the connection and to be aware of what other people may be going through um, in terms of encountering this one question. Yeah, yeah, that's great advice. Thank you for that. So what's your final advice on managing your career? What can one start doing now? Um, so I think my final advice would be to, I mean, I would echo that same advice to do it your own way. I think, um, you know, no matter, I, I often find that, you know, when I talk to peers or um, right now I'm pursuing a different uh, career, uh, transitioning from academia to, you know, as a diversity and inclusion consultant. And in some ways that was a creative path and that was my own path uh, of going that way because I found that, you know, there is, a, 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 there is such a joy for me translating research into understandable and applicable language to something that's going on around the world, especially among organizations. Uh, and so this pivot has really you know, helped me to express myself and yet at the same time um, have purpose in the world in terms of what's going on as well. Uh, and so I would like to encourage people that in their own career path, uh, maybe echoing what Esther earlier said about the TOMO uh, principle as well, right, to find their purpose and where that aligns with, you know, what gives you joy as well. 
Amazing. Thank you so much. That's so great. And now where can people connect with you? At LinkedIn would be the best place. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time and insights. I appreciate you. I'm so glad I found you as well on, on LinkedIn because of your recent blog posts and such a small world that, you know, that we, that uh, we know Jean Kim, who's our speaker next week uh, as well. And who also knows uh, Tanya who's speaking. So I just love how it's such a small world here that we're all connecting uh, today there. Thank you so much for your time, Angie. Thank you. All right. You take care. Bye. <laughs> Oh, all right. That was amazing, right? I'm glad we were able to bring Angie back. Some key lessons from her, like do it your own way. Trust your gut. Find the right support and mentor. Um, find your unique way to speak up as well, right? Find that medium that works for you. Process anything that you need as well. Uh, don't be afraid to, to ask questions there. So, so that was great insights from Angie. So next up, we have Tanya Dessa, who I've met I don't even know how long ago, at least five years ago, almost 10 years ago, I think that I met uh, Tanya and I'm so excited to have her uh, to join me today. Tanya Dessa is the CEO of Dessa Global Leadership, an international leadership training and inclusion consulting firm whose mission is to inspire professionals to find their voice and visibility in corporate workplaces so that they feel more engaged and get promoted. Tanya has traveled to over 80 countries and lived everywhere from China to Switzerland. She values cross-cultural stories and understands how to showcase who you are and why it matters in any environment. Leveraging her MBA and corporate experience at organizations like the World Health Organization, Metatronic and Johnson & Johnson, and working with Fortune 500 clients across five continents, she knows firsthand the power of bringing your whole self to work every day. I'm super excited to have Tana speak with us today on secrets to owning your awesomeness. So type in the chat room, go Tanya, and let's welcome her. Hello. Hey, Diana, how are you? I'm doing fantastic, Tanya. Oh my goodness, I, I wanna give you a hug because it's been so a long. Hug. I a know, it's hug. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. I, I'm so glad we're finally connecting as well. Like, I don't remember when, when we met, but I know it's been at least five years and I've always just loved your energy. I feel like I was just saying like your energy is like on par with where I'm at, the way you show up. <laughs> I love it. We feed off each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How has it been for you? How are you? Fantastic. I mean, you know what, living life in a new way in this pandemic world, but finding everyday ways to appreciate uh, and be really creative about the way we're showing up. So all is well. Amazing. Amazing. So I'm going to kick things off with some rapid fire questions here. So first question is what fulfills you? Celebration. And I feel that now more than ever. I mean, it's everyday celebrations of seeing something funny happening on the street corner when you're waiting to cross the street at a light and then you know making eye contact with a stranger and just laughing out loud. Like that is just an everyday celebration to seeing a family member or a client achieve a big goal, something that they have been working so hard at for years, you know, and being yeah. there to celebrate with them energetically acknowledging them, all that kind of stuff. That just fuels me, lights me up. Oh, I love that. I'm already thinking music as your type of celebration. I just want to dance there. Yes, <laughs> oh, Zoom is a big part of my life. <laughs> oh, I see. So what's, yeah, what's one thing most people don't know about you? Well, now everyone knows I love Zumba. So <laughs> I found, I have a whole YouTube list, big Zumba person. And, and you know, it's funny, I laugh about it, but it really, I think we each have to find something that lights us up that gets us into peak state that gets us yeah. ready to go out and conquer the world or show up at our best so i'm a huge zumba fan and i've loved how i've been able to find some really cool instructors from the philippines russia even our home city wow. of toronto during um you know pandemic times I'm going to need to get your playlist here. <laughs> I'll share it with you. No problem. <laughs> That'd be awesome. So let's talk about um, your cultural upbringing. Uh, what's one cultural value that had an impact on you? Well, I am from an immigrant family. And more importantly, my parents are immigrant entrepreneurs. And so I feel like a few things I really learned from them. We grew up in a household where we, my sisters and I believe and know that anything is possible. You can 
talk about a dream and then you put action to it and make it happen. So I feel like the cultural value, and I'm going to put values, <laughs> I'm going to go plural, rogue here, um, is showing up, believing in your dreams and continuing to take action on it. I really mm. saw that in my parents. We soaked that, that, that up as kids. Um, and, you know, I feel like it reminds me to show up every day, to show up take action, um, keep moving forward towards your dreams. Um, and the other thing that I really you know, took from my cultural upbringing is that it takes a village. My grandparents lived with us, um, you know, helped raise us when we were younger. And I, that is a value that holds true to me today, that your support system matters. And yeah. whether you grow up with them or you create them in your workplace or in the world that you live in, um, support matters. So find your peeps. Uh, find your peeps. Find your tribe. Yeah. Right? I agree with that. Yeah. What's one challenge that you um, encountered in your life or your career due to your race? How did that impact you? You know, it's something that I think Angie spoke about too, um, microaggressions in the workplace. So in my last corporate role, um, I got what I thought was my dream job. And there were these little comments that I kept hearing. Um, at the time, I didn't know that there were microaggressions, but the feeling that I got was that it felt like sideways compliments, you know, or death by a thousand paper cuts. And so the repetition of that, hearing that, you know, I walk into a morning meeting and comments like, oh boy, here's Miss Energizer Bunny. Whoa, too perky for us. You know, the perky North American, tone it down, tone it down. And I started mm. to tone it down until fast forward a few months, maybe even a year later, I was a diluted version of myself. So the challenge there is really remembering who you are and that who you're being is as important as what you're doing every day. Oh, who you're being is just as important as what you're doing every day. That is so important uh, about that. And and, I, and um, I'm curious, is that also what inspired you to what you do today? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, and it takes courage to make a decision to walk away from a previous dream that you wanted so much and you achieved um, and then to realize that you can create a new dream so it was it takes a lot of courage to make that decision and in my experience in my career journey it was saying i've always wanted to be an entrepreneur maybe this is my way so yes it's finding um you know really tapping into that and saying how can i create an environment and uh, where i can bring all of who i am to what i'm doing and then help others feel that impact as well. And so absolutely, that's why I'm doing yeah. what I'm doing today, helping people find that voice and visibility and owning their awesomeness. Let's talk more about that of what's interesting about what you do today. And, and if we can maybe hear more like what you've been seeing like this past year as well, like with you doing the work with a lot of organizations, like what are some of the trends and opportunities there? Sure. So um, at Desa Global Leadership, you know, we work to help women and underrepresented minorities find their voice and visibility. And what I love about what we do as a team is that we work across five continents. And I'm finding that we're more alike than we are not, you know, mm -hmm. um, the same challenges that a working parent may feel in Sydney, Australia is probably pretty similar to someone in San Francisco, you know, so especially now during the pandemic, um, the trend that I'm seeing is we are balancing so many different roles right now. Teacher, yeah. chef, parent, friend, mentor, manager. I mean, you don't have enough fingers to count all of the roles <laughs> that you're playing simultaneously. Am I right, Diana? You're absolutely right. I'm laughing. I'm like, oh, my God. I'm like, I'm nodding here as you're talking about this. Yes. I was like, you're so true. <laughs> and people are juggling a lot of balls. We hear from friends like, this is so, I'm not a good enough parent because I'm not giving enough time or attention to them. So totally. Absolutely. And then with that comes this guilt, this shame yes. of I'm doing, I'm, I'm a bad parent or I'm not being a great leader or, oh, my mentorship meeting. Those have totally fallen by the wayside. And I think right now we have to give ourselves permission, permission to fail, permission to experiment, permission to be who we are and know that it doesn't have to be perfect. We don't have to be perfect. And I really mm. want to double click on that, especially in Asian Heritage Month, because I feel that sometimes as Asians, 
we feel we have to show up perfectly or we have to hit all the boxes. And at a time like this, that is simply not true. We have to give ourselves grace and permission. Mm. Oh, I don't know. That just hit me there. I was like, that's so true. And I have, maybe we could talk a little how, how to go about doing that, right? Of, you know, I talk a lot about uh, setting boundaries, self-care. Like, what are some things we can do to feel just more at peace? Yeah, so I love that. And you mentioned some great ones, like setting boundaries within your team, within your families, yeah. you know, all relationships in your life. To speak those out loud uh, is very powerful. And I think the more that we can do that, the better we get at it. It's like a muscle we keep building and we practice and then it becomes second nature. And that can be a game changer in both your personal life and your professional life, right? So practicing those boundaries is huge. The other part I'd say is you don't have to do it alone. Sometimes we feel like we have to take on everything. We have to say yes. And there's power in no, because when you say no to that timeline, that project, that person, that meeting, that calendar invite without an agenda, hell no, <laughs> all right? You are saying yes to yourself. You're defining what your priorities are and you're committing to investing time and energy where it matters most. So that is important. Um, and yeah. not doing it alone also means leaning into your support network, whether that's family and friends on the personal side or in the workplace, a mentor, a sponsor, a peer ally, you know, yep. somebody who can champion you, ask for help. Um, you know, you can build a very strong bond and relationship with someone when you ask for help. And that's yep. continuing to build on your social capital in the workplace. And that matters too. Mm, that's so good. I want to go back a little bit about your career there. Um, what are some of the highs and lows in your career journey? What are the lessons learned? Yeah. Well, hi, definitely. I went over to Barcelona to do my MBA and I finished in China at Peking University. They <laughs> loved the experiences of that. And what I really want to celebrate from those experiences and then getting a job in kind of Europe was diversity. I mm. loved the diversity of the people around me, their life stories, their journeys, their accents, who they were, where they've come from. And it really, I've learned to honor um, the diversity of the, the richness of the people around me. That has something that still lives very deeply uh, in me. The low, I would say, was being in a role where I felt invisible sometimes, where I couldn't be all of who I was. You know, you'd pull open the door to walk into work and feel like, okay, I gotta put my corporate tan yarn on. I was covering parts of who I really was, maybe that energy, the big eyes, big teeth coming out at you, you know, that's innately me, and feeling like I was trying to be who people wanted me to be. I, it, it, it affected my health, it affected my energy levels, it affected relationships in my life. It was draining the life out of me. And when I realized that, when I finally came to terms with that, I was able to make a change. A change that felt more fulfilling, that felt more energizing. Yeah. I'm going to pivot away, um, but it is tough. If that's how you're feeling, where you are, it takes courage to make that change, and um, it's it's worse if you stay longer, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Just had a comment here from it's a Dion. I saw like I want to be me. Yes, <laughs> so we should yes. love you. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So let's dive into more. But your topic here is how to own your awesomeness with confidence. I love this question. Because I talk about owning your greatness, you talk about owning your awesomeness. Like, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and you know what, it's remembering, how do we own our awesomeness more at work? Um, yeah. It is remembering that you were hired in this position and in this seat for a reason. There is magic that you innately bring into your workplace, into your team, into the company, into the community every single day. And there's this invitation to own it, to own it more fully, you know? Um, owning it can be, can look like acknowledging your strengths, the magic that is you and speaking that out loud, yeah. whether that's in a performance review or on your LinkedIn profile or even in a team meeting. Owning it can be voicing a new idea, challenging status quo in a team meeting, 
you know, and yeah. not fully going through the monologue in your head first, but instead of blurting it. That's what owning your awesomeness can look like, sound like, feel like. So it, it shows up in many different ways. All of it is recognizing that you deserve, you've earned the seat that you're sitting in and playing a little bigger, even if that feels terrifying in the moment. Yeah, yeah. What's your response to those? And I've seen some questions like this, like um, as Asians who don't want to be in the spotlight and, but want to be recognized as well. Like that balance between want to be recognized for their work, but don't want to be feel like they're owning too much where they're in the spotlight there, that they're maybe too loud or outspoken. And what's your response to that? I love this question because I truly believe owning your authenticity, owning your awesomeness, it's about doing it your way. So let's talk introverts or you know, Asian or Asian colleagues who may feel a little bit shyer about being boastful or articulating yeah. out loud their personal brand or why they're awesome. Ask others to speak on behalf of you. That could look like a LinkedIn recommendation from somebody you worked with on a project that you just wrapped up or a former manager, right? That's someone else speaking about your brilliance in, about you to others. Um, it can look like one-on-one -on -one interactions. Sometimes owning your awesomeness doesn't have to be in a really public forum. It doesn't have to be out loud in a crowded room or in a team meeting. It could be a one-on-one -on -one coffee chat. It could be a one-on-one -on -one with your mentor, your sponsor, or your manager. It could be boldly yeah. asking for what you want or articulating areas that you want to grow and develop in, right? So yeah. the invitation here, if you are shyer or an introvert, is to lean in to your strengths, to do it your way, to give yourself permission to do it your way. And the other thing I really want to say to the introverts out there is you have superpowers that are so needed in the workplace and especially now. We're all working from home. And I find that the introverts that I know, some are my family members, some are friends, they are wildly curious. They are amazing at asking questions and holding yeah. space for others to tell their stories. They're amazing at yeah. noticing what's being felt but not really said yet. That is a superpower. Own it. Use it. We need more uh, of it. Oh, I love this. It's like a motivational talk right now. I love <laughs> this. It's to own it, right? Thank you for addressing that because I've been getting those questions as well. And I, I, I talk about, you know, when I talk about, even, I know you talk about branding as well of um, owning your greatness and people feel like that, hey, like I need to be loud, to be super outspoken in order to stand out uh, or I need to be in your face. And I mean, like, no, it, it's not that. Like you can actually you know, do it like in a one-on-one -on -one way as well. It doesn't mean that you have to be speaking loudly all the time. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a follow-up question to this is how to find your voice and visibility to get promoted? Mm -hmm. So again, you know, allies, sponsors, mentors are key, but what's yeah. more important is giving them the talking points. I find so mm. often, you know, we'll walk into a performance review or we'll go into a mentorship meeting and we'll just expect our manager or our mentors to know all the incredible things we've been doing. And the invitation here is for each and every one of us to take radical responsibility for our own career journey. That may look like setting up a success file. So one thing I love to do is in my inbox, set up a little success file. So anytime I get an email of you know participants or a client giving a thank you or acknowledgement, a compliment or a recommendation, I file it away. And, you know, in the corporate world, I would use that as data, as evidence of the value and the impact that I was making in the workplace. I would bring that in to performance reviews. I would bring those stories, those case studies into mentorship meetings. Um, and then uh, the other thing I would do is um, ask for what you want before you feel totally ready. You know, I'm sure, Diana, you know, the HP study when, you know, HP looked at when people were getting promoted, you know, they noticed the gender difference. Women only applied for roles when they felt they met 100% of the criteria, whereas men applied yeah. when they met roughly 60%. Yeah. It is not a, it's not a competence gap. It is a confidence gap. So I feel like there's this opportunity for each and every one of us to leap, to put up our hand, to go for that promotion before we feel totally ready. Because the truth is, if you're meeting 100% of the qualifications and then you're applying for the job, you're going to be bored in three weeks. True. Right? So true. Growth there. 
So true. Oh my God. I love what you just highlighted. It's not a competence gap. It's a, it's a confidence gap uh, there. Right. I, and I love that. And I see this with a lot of clients I work with when we start working with their mindset and confidence, the way they show up and how they speak changes, the conversation changes as well, the way they influence. Exactly, exactly. And you help them bring that magic out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's believing in themselves. I, I, I love what you said, it's a confidence there. Um, so how to talk about cross-cultural stories at work that fosters inclusion and enhances productivity? Mm. Owning your story. I feel mm. like there's this opportunity for us to own our narrative. Um, <laughs> I think it was one of the other speakers and mentioned, you know, that question, where are you from? I got that so often, um, especially living abroad as, as often as I have done. Uh, and often people would look at me and make assumptions it's as when I'd say I'm Canadian. No, no, but where are you really from? No, come on, tell me where you're really from, right? Um, mm -hmm. I said, oh, if you could be Canada, you'll see that I'm really from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of people that look like me, trust me. Um, yeah. And I realized I used to feel frustrated. I used to feel awkward, uh, maybe defensive answering that question. And now I take ownership of my story. I and then I write my own story. So I get to um, articulate, whether it's articulating my role and what I do every day or where I've come from and who I am, what my identity is based, it's based on my story. I put language to that and I own that fully. And I think the more that we can do that, it gives power and permission in the workplace for all of us to bring who we really are into work every day. You know, more of where we've come from and leveraging our cultural stories, um, knowing that it can be very impactful. We can potentially, where we've come from can mean we potentially can help with market expansion opportunity or reach a new customer segment because we understand them better than any other colleague around the table. So leveraging your diversity, who you are matters, and I consider it to be a career up leveler. So I invite people to really see it that way too. Oh, I love that message. Own your story. I have to tell you, Tanya, like, I feel like it's really just for me, like the past year where I started also telling more stories about my upbringing. And, and, and I think part of it's finding my own voice as well. And then for the longest time, I had this limiting relief that because English is not my first language, that I didn't want to tell my story. I feel like awkward telling it. And it wasn't until I started doing it this, this past year that I'm connecting with more people on a different level. Oh, I love that, Diana. And that yeah. has so much power. I mean, yeah. kudos for people who are showing up and working in their second or third language. That is incredible. Like, why yeah. don't we honor that? Give kudos to that, you know? Yeah, yeah. I just started doing it. And I noticed I'm just connecting people at a different level, the relationships. And, and so, so thank you for reinforcing that message because I really do believe that. I, I just started doing it. And, and it's also now I feel like it's therapeutic for me to reflect back of, who I am, uh, what I stand for, what's important to me, what's the impact I want to make uh, in this world are. And I feel, Diana, when we do that, we automatically give permission for the people around us to do the same, right? You're because right. When we do that once, we're role modeling that others can do it as well. And that's a really powerful kind of ripple effect. Yes, absolutely. So what's your final advice on managing your career? Own your awesomeness. And what I mean by that is taking radical responsibility for the way that you show up, um, you know, leaping before you feel totally ready and remembering that you don't have to do it alone. Lean into peer mentors, you know, sponsors, champions and advocates. And I feel like now is the time. Um, build, start those coffee meetings, you know, whether they're on Zoom or socially distanced walks in the park. I feel like the investment that you make today in relationships it is social equity that you are building in your career. And whether yeah. you use it three days from now or three years from now, know that you'll be using it. So continue to build and invest in relationships. Amazing, amazing. So lastly, Tanya, where could uh, people find you? Our socials are at Dessa Global Leadership. Uh, you can connect with me, Tanya Dessa, on LinkedIn or Dessa Global Leadership. Um, on our website, we've got some really cool, um, you know, own your awesomeness activities and strategies. So definitely check that out. Uh, I'd love to connect with anyone we can offer value to and help to motivate and help them own their awesomeness, especially in corporate teams. Yes, amazing. Oh, thank you so much for your time and insights. I 
I'm so inspired by you. I love the work that you do as well. We're so aligned and can't wait to reconnect with you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Diana. All right. You take care. Bye, Tanya. Bye. Oh my goodness, wasn't that amazing? Oh, we learned so much here with some of the key lessons that we learned today was to, from Tanya, is to really find your voice. I love what she said about that. It's important to really be true to who you are, not just what you do at work, uh, to celebrate as well, even the little things uh, in life. Give yourself grace, especially in times of uncertainty and so many things that we're juggling with. Um, own your story and own your awesomeness. Um, the world needs you, needs your light and that you matter there. So, and uh, don't forget to raise your hand for promotion as well, to speak up, start that success file. That's something I tell my clients to do as well, right? Track all your accomplishments there. All right, so awesome. Well, this is so great. So we're gonna take a mini break, a mini intermission here, a one minute break, and then we'll be back, do a little stretch. I'm gonna do a little stretch as well. And then we're gonna have my next speaker, uh, Cindy Wong here to speak. Uh, she's uh, been recognized as Canada as one of the top 100 most powerful women uh, there. So I'm really excited to speak with her. So I'll give you a one minute break and I'll be back. All right, so welcome back to our fourth speaker on the Amplifying Asian Voices series. I am so delighted that you're here. If you're here, type in hello, welcome. We have three more speakers for the day. So next up, we have Cindy Wong. Cindy is a progressive marketing leader with expertise in growing brands and transforming businesses. She's currently the head of marketing and communications at The Cooperators. Prior to that, she had an amazing career at HSBC, where she was the regional head of marketing in North America. She is passionate about creating an inclusive, value-led culture to motivate and nurture top teams that strive for excellence and, cha and challenge traditional solutions. She is the 2020 recipient of Canadian Marketing Association's Marketer of the Year and Canada's Top 100 Most Powerful Women Award. Are you guys excited? Type in Go Cindy to welcome her to the stage here. All right. Hi, Cindy. Hey, Diana. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, I'm really excited. I got caught the tail end of uh, Tanya's discussion. It sounds like some great advice and um, looking to hear the rest of the sessions as well. So yeah, yeah. So we're going to kick things off with some rapid fire questions. Um, what's one thing most people don't know about you? Oh, my goodness. Um, I probably have the superpower where I can consume a lot of information in a very quick time frame and to kind of cluster things. Um, mm. But it just probably is my ability to scan a book and to read the last page uh, first. So um, I, I tend to be able to just get a lot of information very quickly. Uh, it's been yeah. very helpful in my new job. So, ah, that's good. That's good. And what fulfills you? What fulfills me? Uh, I love riddles. I love solving riddles. I love um, puzzle pieces. I like the jumbo. I like the crossword. I like solving challenges. Um, so anything where I can kind of come up with a solution, which makes it really fun to be marketing because we're always solving riddles, right? So yeah, yeah, nice. And what does success and happiness mean to you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say where there's harmony within work and the family and good yeah. balance. I think it's just sometimes it's hard to, it, it's easy to not have that balance. Um, and if I could find that balance, that would be a, a very harmonious life and a very happy Cindy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
So let's move into about your cultural upbringing. Tell us a little bit about your story and uh, what's one cultural value that had an impact on you, good or bad? Um, so I know this is the Asian Heritage Month, so I should probably bring back some of my heritage and, and maybe some of the my upbringing, what brought us to Canada and some of the things of that journeys brought me where I am now, right? So my uh, I'm the oldest of three girls. I was uh, six, my sisters were five and three when we immigrated to Canada. And at the time, my father and my mother wanted us to move to Canada because being females, they thought we would have a better life coming to Canada versus being in Hong Kong. And we were, uh, we were all born in Hong Kong and moved to, um, uh, to Canada, but they erroneously made the decision to move to Northern Ontario in the middle of February. So if anybody's from Northern Ontario, we moved to Timmins, Ontario in February, where it was minus 40 degrees. And I think the you know, warmest clothing we bought was probably a very light, light parka, because I think anybody who's lived in Hong Kong can't even imagine anything, you know, below zero. So um, I think that whole shock and having to survive mode and not necessarily thrive mode, um, it just impacted me very quickly at a very young age. I came at, when I was six and I was able to speak English better than my parents. Um, so because of that, I, you know, I was the person who had to figure out the cable, the bus system, um, admit us into schools. And so a lot of that cultural upbringing, which is about nurturing the family first, is what compelled my parents to move. That mm -hmm. then helped me to kind of take care of my family and, and kind of just figure things out. Um, and, and I think that move and all those things have really defined who I am, the type of things um, that I like to do and kind of my curiosity and my... Um, it just, just you know, we talk about just going for it. A lot of it's just kind of doing things and not thinking. Yeah. About it, right. Yeah. 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 Did you have any pressure from your family at all in terms of pressure to succeed or what to do? Yeah, it, it's very different than because we talk about cultural. I, I would say that uh, the typical Asian family style, you hear about the tiger moms. Uh, that was not the case on my family side. And I think um, my parents really moved here to give us a better life. And maybe sometimes I wouldn't say depending, I wouldn't say those are high or low expectations. It wasn't therefore you shall be a doctor, therefore you should become a dentist or, or a lawyer. Uh, it was to give us a better life. And um, most of that we we found on our own, right? In terms of things that we want to do. So our joke was when I got into business school, um, my mom thought she didn't know what business was and I didn't know how to translate from Chinese, <laughs> from English to Chinese. Cause my English was, my, my Chinese was broken having grown up in Timmins. And so I said to mom, you know, when you're in business and you, 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 and we had a local Wolko for anybody who knows, it's kind of like the king. Wolko, I remember. Yes. Yes. Wolko. I remember Wolko, yes. And I said, mom, you know, you go to the Wolko, it's like running or helping out. Like, oh, so I heard afterwards from my mom's friends that she thought that I was going to school to become a cashier. And that at some point, I would become the manager after being a cashier, and that I would have to go through four years of schooling to do that. Um, so when you say the expectation, the expectation was that they were happy if we can fulfill and do a respectable job, but it was up to us to figure out what we wanted to do. Right. So the pressure was not necessarily there. The pressure from my parents, the pressure was probably on my sisters and I to make sure we pa gave a path for ourselves. Right. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I can totally relate to that, too, because I, I immigrated to Canada um, when I was five. Um, so I totally relate to your story there. Um, what's one challenge you encountered in your life or career due to your race? Uh, how did that impact you? So growing up in small town Timmins, Ontario, where the language spoken was French and English, um, Chinese was not really um, very prevalent, right? I mean, I remember watching, I'm dating myself, you know, watching the Brady Bunch with my sisters and I, and we're like, why are we not blonde? Like, why are we not having dinner at five o'clock and eating the way people eat, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so it, it was that small upbringing. It, I think it's very different with my kids growing up in Toronto, we're very diverse. They would have went to school with, you know, Chinese speaking or even other cultures. Um, we were very much immersed in a French Canadian culture. And surprisingly, and, you know, we didn't face a lot of, I would say, um, intentful racism or intentful um, type of uh, adversity because I think we were good in school I'll be honest I mean and that maybe was our saving grace because we kind of got by we were one of you know the good kids and we didn't get negatively um, biased that way um, so I was surprised that when I went to school went to it in business school and you know um, very at the time very few females and Asians in business school and those who did went into the CA stream um, and 
so when I went to work and I, I started my first job in corporate banking with the bank and uh, very few females, very male dominated, the team was very, very good. But I think what I found the, um, the impact of the racism was actually from clients. Again, it was microaggression. It was not intended, mm. but they would say very, very early on within the first five minutes of, um, so without asking how old I was, so how long have you been working? Um, so what did you study in school? So to me, that meant, are you qualified? Mm. Do you have a business degree? And um, and how old are you? You know, are you going to yeah. manage my account? Do you have the credibility and do you have the technical uh, the skills? So there was a lot of that for a while. I was one of those people, I was celebrated turning 30 because I could stop lying at that point because when I was in my 20s, when I started my career, I kept saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm 30, right? Um, but when I actually turned 30, Oh my God, thank goodness. Now I can actually <laughs> be my authentic self, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. Let's dive into you about your career here. Um, tell us about, I guess, a career defining moment that changed the trajectory of your career. What are some of the decisions that were made? Um, you know, I, I've had some I've had some great roles within my career, and I can't say I made any regrets with any of them because they've all just been each one is completely in terms of it's a stepping stone to the next one, help me build it. But I would say that the pivotal one, pivotal one was, um, so when I had joined, I joined actually Lloyds Bank at a university and Lloyds Bank was bought out by HSBC very early on. And I remember um, Lloyds Bank had a international program and the international program, I, I think because we just got bought out, I remember my manager didn't know much about this program. So they said, you know, we're gonna send you off to Hong Kong for three months. And I said, oh, for good? He said, we really don't know, um, but just just go do it. <laughs> and um, I said, okay, all right, um, we'll figure it out later. So I went off for three months. We found out um, after three months, it was great. It was very broad training. We did um, outward bound for 10 days. It was a survival thing. And then we did um, training from, you know, being taught by Deloitte for financial statements to um, Accenture at the time in terms of management. So three months of um really good management training. We found out that was the executive training program. So I loved it. At the end of it though, they wanted a wanted me to sign on to become their um, international manager. And it was a program that, you know, where they have a certain amount of people around the world that they literally within a five minute, you know, call, they ask you to go to another part of the world and you have two weeks to pack up and go. So for, you know, a 22 year old, it was really adventurous. I'd love to see the world. And it was really, really, like I said, a dream come true in terms of I didn't even know what this was. Didn't even know it existed. Yeah. Um, but the pivotal point in, and where I talk about this was um, it, when it came down to contract, there was two clauses that didn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, and maybe it's it, it, to say it, it wouldn't exist anymore, this type of clause. So it's by no means anything about HSBC. It made a lot of sense at the time. But one of the clauses what I was that um, I couldn't get married for the first five years. Um, and if I were to get married, the spouse would be interviewed. Um, and and the intent was because it's a tough life. It was a very male dominated life because at the time, not many women would take this role. Um, and it was the idea so that the spouse knew what they were getting into. So a joint mm -hmm. would make the proper dis decision. Now, you know, I was 22, like I said, no boyfriend at the time, not even any anything in the horizon. Um, but I just didn't like the idea of someone controlling uh, my career and, um, and just having to sign it early on the rest of my life. So I turned that down, and when I turned that down, um, the bank, when I came back, what they were really great about it is that they said, you know, we know you are, and, and this generalist type of role was that they would do everything. You could manage a mm. call center somewhere um, in the middle of the desert, then you move into somewhere else and you're managing, um, you know, traders, right? So it was really abroad. That's why they trained you for three months. Um, so when I came back to Canada, I said, you know, I really like uh, my curious side would like to learn a bit about everything. I don't necessarily want to go down one stream. Um, and they were really good at trying to promote that curiosity and try to feed off that curiosity. And because of that move, I've been able to do so many various jobs in the bank um, that allowed me to really just grow. So I started in corporate banking. My next role, I moved into HR, which is a totally different projectile, right? Um, and then I moved into retail banking and then I had to get myself licensed. I had to train yeah. myself. Um, and then, so it just kind of grew from there. And obviously I, I've been in marketing for the longest time now, but um, at that, that pivotal moment when I wanted to define who I was, realize what I, the parameters I didn't like, um, yeah. I kind of set my own goals, right? Mm, so what I'm hearing is knowing yourself and, you know, what are those goals that are important to you that matter to you uh, there? What would you say have been the key factors that contributed to your career success? 
couple of things. I think having people that support you, um, I, I mm -hmm. think having people who believe in your goals as much as um, you believe in them. I've always said to my team, you know, if I don't care about your development plans as much as you do, you might as well fire me because no one's going to help you uh, advance. No one's going to believe in you and, and kind of talk about you and help you support you outside of the room right because um and, and i've been very lucky at having blessed you know despite having different career paths i've always had managers who said okay you know what don't know if that's the best for you but this is what you want i'll support you it's kind of like being a parent right and just seeing and helping you through that progress yeah yeah so i want to dive into some advice questions here um is how to differentiate yourself even when you're not fully qualified for the job and i know this is the topic of your talk here is not qualified just go for it <laughs> yeah so as i said I, I think if you have a curious mind and you have a desire to try to do something i think we're, we're so preoccupied to making sure we check all the qualifications when we see a posting or a yeah. job. It's like, oh, I don't have that. Okay, let's not do it, right? Uh, and I think sometimes that is partly an Asian trait because you want to get that A. So you want to make sure that you're accepted and that that's part. And partly it's a female thing too, right? We want to make sure we do it really well. I say to my kids, do something that scares you every day. And if that means something you really are not qualified for, but you have the attitude and you have the um, passion to do it, I, I think people should jump into it and just go for it. Because like I said, when I went from corporate banking and I have a finance degree, when I applied for the regional head of marketing, fairly big job, I was managed Eastern Canada. So it was, so not marketing, sorry, human resources. When I made that jump, very different skill set, right? From corporate lending to HR. And it was to manage um, Ontario, Quebec and the Maritimes. And I remember applying for it and the HR interviewed me. At first, I think my, it was my manager who said, I don't think you should do it, but if you do, I'm going to put your name forward and push you into it. I got the interview and of course, HR probably thought, well, what are you doing? Um, but I, when I explained to them what I wanted to do and they realized the skill sets that was needed for that job, maybe not necessarily the actual training or the ex or technical skills, but but the aptitude and, and the desire where it's very applicable, right? You can, they're transferable skills um, and I think people need to remember that most of our stuff, even though we've been on one discipline, are transferable skills. And, and if you have that attitude, I always say, you know, unless you are a doctor trying to find a cure for cancer, I think most of us can try to do anything. So I really mm -hmm. believe in that. Yeah, yeah. And a follow-up question, follow to questions today is that how to be great at marketing promoting yourself? I know you're, you're in marketing. What advice, I guess, you for those who struggle with marketing themselves? A lot of times I hear is like, I don't want to be too boastful or arrogant. Um, but in reality right now, also the, the market is quite competitive as well. Like what can people do to really promote themselves effectively? I think it starts with knowing who you are first and then knowing how, what you want to project yourself, right? I always say, what is the brand that you want people, you want to leave with when people see you? We all see it. You, you've been in a meeting room. You, you know the brand. You, you've got the really smart person who doesn't talk much. You've got the really um, loud person who may not has valuable to say, say, you know, so everyone has a brand presence. And so you probably want to understand your what the brand presence is that you want to have in the room. What is it that when people leave, you want to say, well, Diana is really articulate. Diana is so well spoken. Because everyone should have those couple of elevators points that people should see you. And because you don't always have the full agenda full time, but what are those couple of things? We all do it. We, our instincts is to gather those feedback for people, whether it's at dinner table, at the bus, at the subway, on the plane, you have those. So what is the brand presence that you want to project? Um, and figure that out first. What is, what's your North Star? What do you want to be? Then get some feedback on what is the brand presence you currently project? Right. If you're great, if that gap is filled, I think it's great because then that's continue doing it. If it isn't, then work on that brand presence. I think really work on the things that you want to promote. But you're not seeing the people. If you know you are articulate and you know you are um, you are very thoughtful and you're, you're very strategic, but you tend to be quieter and you want to project that, then, then make it a point to move towards that. Right. And mm -hmm. so understand what is the brand presence you want to create and everybody should be able to say those couple of things about you once yeah you room. yeah i agree with that knowing your brand presence is key um you know i always say your brand is your greatest asset so if you want to know what it is yep 
what's your advice for those who, um, for reaching, if I just want to reach like an executive level position, how to really position yourself for success? I think it starts off with, it goes back to when you're building your career, do something that scares you. I really don't <laughs> think people should really push themselves outside of their comfort zone. It's easy to just keep doing one thing. Now, if that's what you want to do, it's great. But I think if you show that um, flexibility, that adaptability, I think it says a lot about your brand. I think that if you are trying to promote yourself and we all have a seat at the table, I've always said, if you have a seat at the table, even if you're not the most senior person, take the titles out of the room and act like you actually have a seat at the table. Right. And that means asking the questions. That means being curious, asking questions outside of what you're brought in for. So if you have a seat at the table in, in finance and it's in a general executive committee, and of course you're presenting the finance stuff, uh, but after someone's, you know, you know, if they are presenting something on a product, ask about how that product works. I think executives and people managers, when they're looking at their next person they want to hire, they want them to see if they got those transferable skills. They want to see their thinking. They, you don't, again, it's that brand presence. You don't want them to think, oh, that's a great finance person. Mm -hmm. You want, them, wow, that's a really, that, that person can really, you know, join the dots. They're very um, in, in, uh, intuitive. They, they ask a lot of right questions that type of stuff helps your brand does help right and i think it you, you need to be curious you need to step outside of your comfort zone uh don't worry about titles and just the fact that you have a seat at the table says a lot yeah i love that advice and i love what you said about um people want to understand your way of thinking and this is what i see a lot of times with interviews people want to understand how you approach problems or how you solve problems as well as your, the way you 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 think there right right yeah yeah um how to look for opportunities internally. Like I know you had a long career at HSBC. Um, how do you go about navigating, you know, such a big company, uh, finding the right opportunities for you? You know, I, I, every time I did development discussion with my manager, it wasn't always a job that I wanted. I'd always look for, here's where I think I'd like to understand more of, right? So for example, what, what made me do the leap of corporate banking to HR, which again, not natural, um, but I thought, okay, at some point I'm probably going to want to manage people. I'm going to have to manage people and I don't want to do it by promotion because I find that you don't really have time to really do the things that you want to learn. Um, so to me, that was my desire to move into an HR role, right? Because I thought, okay, well, how, how, how will I be able to figure out people's compensation? How do I figure out hiring? How do I do all this stuff? It gives me time to figure it out. It's, it was a crash course. So I think as you navigate through promotions or even lateral moves, it's it's what type of things drive your curiosity, but what also type of things um, will help you build that cumulative skill that you need, right? Because I truly believe cumulatively everything you do, it's never wasted. Even mm -hmm. if... You know, I, I was in retail lending for probably the shortest time in my life, probably two years. Um, but that stuff taught me a lot. I got licensed to become, I can do financial plans now. I can do things like that. Am I going to use it in my marketing? No. But when I'm, when I'm in a room speaking to retail people, when I can rhyme off some of those things, it gives me a lot of credibility outside of my specialty. Um, so I'm saying as people navigate and look for jobs, look for things that cumulative benefit, but also that satisfies your curiosity, because I do think mm -hmm. that, um, that curiosity piece is a big part of, uh, has been a big part of my career and how I've navigated it. Curiosity. I love that. And, um, what do you look for when you're hiring for your team? Probably a combination of everything I said, I, I look for people who have passion, who have the attitude. Um, it's not necessarily the skills. So I've hired people who um, just have never done their jo the job that I was hiring for ever. Um, but they, I, they've they really shown the attitude and, and the uh, passion to learn um, and give me a short time frame. And they say, you know what? I know I don't have this, but I give me six months, I can figure this out. And, and because I have to practice what I preach, I have to do something that scares me every day. So it scares the heck out of me that I'm not hiring someone really qualified. But if I really believe in the person, then I've got to take a leap as well. I think Tanya said that taking that leap, right? Um, yeah. And, and just believing in my instincts um, and believing in the person that I want to and giving them that trust. Because when you give that trust, the same way my parents gave to me at a very young age, um, I actually think people propel to do much bigger things and have a lot more independence um, and have greater outputs if you kind of willing to take that risk on them. Yeah, love that advice there. And what's your final advice on managing and advancing your career? I think if I could wrap up everything I said, I, I really do think um, 
be curious. Yeah. Um, be adaptive. Don't be locked in. You may have a map. You may have a say, this is what I want to do, but just know that maps are meant to be thrown away or put away temporarily. And so if you have something changes, don't fret because again, it's cumulative, right? I do think cumulative, you're all going to learn something. So have a map and be ready to put it away. Um, and along the way, you may have to do something that scares you. Curiosity is forcing you to turn to a road less traveled, right? Um, and, and so all of that, I do think it ends well. And I know it's hard for some of the real planners um, in there and some people who are really, really good at having that roadmap. I, I'm yeah. just saying you'd be very curious to, uh, no, you'd be very delighted to see what can be ahead, that's all. Right, right. Oh, thank you so much, Cindy, for your time and advice. And I want to congratulate you within your, your new role and your recognitions that you received this past year as well. I'm so delighted that I had the opportunity to talk to you today. Thanks, Dan. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. You take care. Bye now. Okay, bye. Bye. Wow, that was amazing. We just had a conversation with Cindy Wong and we learned a lot. I just wanna quickly summarize some of the key lessons here before I introduce you our, our next uh, speaker here. So some key lessons I hear from Cindy was um, do what scares you, right? Um, be ambitious, um, know your brand presence to promote yourself um, and be adaptable in new situations, new opportunities. Act like you have a seat at the table there. So those were some key lessons from Cindy Wong there. So next up, we have John Yip, who's coming up to speak with us. Let me just get that up here. So, so next up, we have John. John Yip is a president and CEO of Kensington Health, a not-for-profit community-based residential and ambulatory health services provider. John has over 25 years of experience in the healthcare industry as a management consultant and as an executive. John holds an MBA in health services management from McMaster University. John sits on a number of board of directors and is a member of the Institute of Corporate Directors. So let's welcome him on stage. Type in the chat room. Go, John, to welcome him and raise the vibrational energy here. Hi, Diana. How are you? Hi, John. Welcome. So great to finally connect with you here. No kidding. You're almost two hours in. How, how do you have so much energy? <laughs> I got some water, I got my honey, I'm good. I'm, I'm just, I'm excited. Like I, I always say, like I, I keep my North Star, my why, why I do this. And for me, it's really empowering people and you know, inspire and hear stories to, to help others. Awesome, well, let me try and help you. <laughs> well, I'm so glad we got connected. I think just a couple of weeks ago through CN and I love the interview you had with her. And I was like, I would love to invite you to, to chat. So why don't we start off with a rapid fire question on what fulfills you? Well, I think doing things like this fulfills me. I think it's all about paying it forward. I had a lot of mentors who guided me, and I think this is one opportunity, one channel, one really cool channel to to pay it forward with your audience today uh, to just impart a small nugget of wisdom that I've accumulated in my own journey. So uh, I think paying it forward is, uh, is a, a key driver. Nice. What are three words uh, others would use to describe you? Uh, well, <laughs> you can ask my wife. She'll have three different words. Uh, <laughs> you, but uh, I think it's authentic, uh, empathetic, um, and leadership. Nice. Um, what's your superpower? Well, I do have a spidey sense, and the spidey sense is around uh, the intuition I have on certain things. Like I, I follow it, I listen to it, uh, it does tingle, and I usually, 80% of the time, follow what that sense is telling me. Uh, I don't call it superhero, I just find it, you know, years of experience, you're starting to you know, establish a certain degree of patterns around human behavior, around decision making, around problem solving. Uh, mm -hmm. so you get this keen sense of how to work around it. Mm, nice. So let's dive into about your cultural upbringing. Can you tell us a bit about that and what's one cultural value that had an impact on you, good or bad? Yeah, so here we, I'm in uh, the heart of Kensington Market where our organization is located. Funny enough, 200 meters down the street is where my grandparents emigrated to Canada from China. Uh, and I grew up running a, around the streets of Chinatown and Kensington Market. So it's full circle that I'm working in the community that I, I grew up in. And so these streets, the history of these streets means a lot to me, uh, particularly Chinatown. 
uh, I've seen Chinatown evolve. And some of the things that it's really taught me about our culture is, you know, be humble. Like we're a very humble uh, uh, culture. It's not about bragging about our own achievement. It is making other people better. Um, if you raise everyone, uh, you yourself will feel raised as well. And I think that's a hallmark of uh, the Asian culture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what's one challenge that you encounter in your life or career due to your race? How did it impact you? I had to think about this because I, uh, I think I've had a pretty smooth ride despite what's been going on around the world around anti-Asian racism. Um, and so I think it's actually the opposite. It's positive stereotypes, positive biases that, hey, John, you're Asian. You must be Dr. Yip. You must be a physician or, oh, you're not a physician. Oh, you're, you're, oh, you're a lawyer or you're an accountant. Well, actually, I'm, I'm neither. Um, and to the, you know, to the horror of my parents, uh, you know, when I uh, didn't get into medical school and we come from a family of physicians, uh, you know, the horror. And so I get this positive stereotype that, oh, you, you must be a physician, but I'm not. And I think, uh, you know, it, it's very counterintuitive to a lot of the population that thinks that we are the model uh, immigrants, uh, that we are, uh, our career path is predestined, uh, pre uh, uh, our destiny is already pre-chosen, um, but it's not. And I think we're individuals and uh, individuals within a very vibrant culture. Yeah, yeah. Um, and let's dive into talking about your career here is what's uh, interesting about what you currently uh, do? Uh, well, I am in healthcare, and so it's a fascinating time to be in healthcare in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we have an interesting uh, array of services, and one of them is a 350-bed uh, long-term care home. And during the pandemic, it's these homes like ours that were hit very, very hard uh, during wave one and a little bit during wave two. And so 350 people um, and their families have entrusted their care in our organization. I feel uh, personally responsible, personally accountable for their safety and well-being. And so during the pandemic, we've done some things here that I don't think I'll ever see again. Hopefully I don't have to see again in my career. So be able to serve and serve in a time of challenging circumstances, I think really is what drives me to be in a uh, caring environment. Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, I did, you mentioned on the off the top, I did come from management consulting. I spent uh, almost, uh, 17 years uh, you know, in the big big firms and as uh, in my own boutique firm. And it, it was driven by the bottom line. I have nothing against organizations that that's what their main value is. But now I'm on the other side, it is very much mission driven. It's about serving and it's particularly serving in a time of need like in, in this pandemic. So that gives me great fulfillment. Um, so maybe I'm answering your first question about what it fulfills you. And I, I think that's what it really is, is the ability to serve and serve the families and having a positive impact in their quality of life. Mm. And so would you say that's what um, led you to pivoting from consulting to uh, working nonprofit? I don't think, uh, looking back, I don't think that's what I was thinking at the time. Uh, I could say that now, so yes. <laughs> uh, at the time, it was a client, this is a very you know common story. You consult, you and the client develop a relationship, and the client wants to hire you in-house, and that's what happened. And I fought uh, this client uh, for months. I said, no, 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 you know, I, I'm not ready to pivot. I'm not ready to take a massive cut in my salary. Uh, but I think after a couple months of uh, him really being persistent, you know, I had a, a shift in that pivot moment, which was, this is not about compensation. This is about building out your executive uh, toolkit. And I was missing huge chunks uh, of it. You know, being a good executive, working at a board of directors, with the board of directors being the corporate secretary, leading disparate functional teams, and bring an organization together. These are things you don't necessarily get a chance to do as a consultant. So my mindset was, you know what, I'm gonna spend the next couple of years, well, it's eight years now, uh, in, in investing in building out that executive toolkit. And that toolkit, even though you fill those blocks, they keep reinventing themselves. So now as a first time CEO, 
there are other skills that I, I want to fulfill uh, as a, an executive in a not for profit. But it, it, one big thing is about that mission driven approach. And I, I've grown to respect it uh, quite like it. I find it challenging to sometimes fulfill that mission, like in the pandemic. But it really lights the fire under uh, my chair to, to get up every day to do something, do good to the world. Nice, nice. What would you say are some of the key factors that's contributed to your career success? Yeah, so I talked about this at the beginning, uh, the mentorship. Uh, you know, we didn't have, <laughs> in my day, <laughs> uh, I had shoes when I walked to school, but uh, we, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have this cool technology, the Restream Studio software, you know, live streams. That's, that's what, what an amazing development. And, yeah. and, you know, and back in my day, you had to pick up the phone, look at the phone book, call, you know, you know cold call people, and you never see their face. You don't know what they look like. People reject you. But, you know, people are so uh, giving. And if you ask any leader, um, most will say, yeah, I'm happy to help. And so over the years, I've uh, gotten to know a lot of people that have become my mentors. Um, some of them, I, uh, they were mentees. And so the tables turn. So it is not just a mentor-mentee type of relationship. Those eventually evolve so that the mentee becomes your mentor. And so uh, I think having a good support system around a mentorship, uh, family as well, uh, being able to mm -hmm. those pivots and career, like taking a big salary cut to go in the not-for-profit sector is a part of the support of my family. Um, and also, you know, people say it's good. Oh, John, you're so lucky, you know, Double happiness, 888, you know, well, no, you, you create that, right? You create the conditions for good luck. And so I think it is really understanding where those opportunities are to be able to find that little nook and cranny and be able to pry it open to create your own opportunities. So I think those are some of the things that I think have paved my paved way for uh, success in my career. Mm, that's great advice. What have been the biggest challenges in leading? Uh, during a pandemic? Well, you know, I think uh, early on, uh, we were really short staffed. I happened to be on our COVID floor. Uh, and usually we have about eight staff uh, there, and there are only two. And so I made my way up there, and um, they were struggling. They were struggling to feed. Uh, so some of our residents are can't feed themselves. And so I just rolled up my sleeves, put on the proper uh, personal protective equipment, and, and uh, started helping out. Uh, well, I uh, it lasted 102 days uh, of helping and during meal times, and really understood uh, the nature of this uh, of the pandemic. Really understood the frontline care, the true heroes that we talk about in the media during this pandemic, and it was eye opening in terms of how committed our staff, not just our staff, but staff across the country around the world, uh, were to. The people who have entrusted their care to us mm -hmm. and so that framed the whole sequence of decisions that had i not been on the floor i don't think i would have made the decisions i did so enacting universal masking before the government uh required us to do so um handing out a dwindling supply of n95 masks even though it wasn't required giving pandemic pay before the government uh gave pandemic pay uh, redeploying staff that wanted to work and volunteer into our uh, long-term care home from our ambulatory side, being there for families uh, and answering every single question, calling them individually, uh, doing Zoom chats, Zoom town halls really early on to ensure a transparent line of communication. All those decisions help set the scene to really uh, motivating our staff, inspiring our staff to do what they could to protect uh, the people in our care. And I think because of that, you know, we were at 98% vaccination of our residents, 90% vaccination of our staff, zero positive cases in three months. So this wow. is attributed to uh, the commitment of our staff. And it goes back to day one of the pandemic. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. How do you manage stress and take care of your mental health? Like as I'm hearing everything you tell me, I'm like, wow, there's just so much to deal with and just so many decisions to make or uncertainty. How do you take care of yourself? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's a, an issue around health and wellness of our staff. 
And, I, and I, when I tell staff, I know what you're going through, I can say that with credibility. I've been there. I know what they're feeling. I was scared. And, I, you know, in the story I tell my staff is because they saw me. I came out of the elevator on day one. I threw up. I threw up by the elevator. I didn't know what I was walking into in that hallway. We didn't know much about COVID at the time. Um, and so it, it, with the PPE on, you can't see anything but people's eyes. And you can see the fear in their eyes. So, you know, I think in order to take care of other people, you got to take care of yourself. So the day after uh, the pandemic was declared a, a pandemic, uh, I started a project uh, and it's called hashtag run every street. So I'm a triathlete and I decided to run every single street in the city of Toronto. Um, and this journey, like I continue uh, to this day um, and I, I don't run the same route. I, look, I run different streets every day. I run laneways, which are fantastic little streets that connect major streets. There's fantastic artwork. Uh, this is the time that I think can work through the problems. And I can feel myself rewiring my, my neurons, but also how I look at a certain issue. Pre-project, I would look at it pretty linearly. Now I look at it in three dimensions, four dimensions, and it's actually given me a very distinct perspective of how to solve a particular problem and in turn reduces and diminishes the, the stress I feel. So I do this before coming into work. Uh, you can see it, the bike behind me. So today is a bike day. Yeah, uh, yeah. I rode, uh, you know, the uh, mountain bike trails in the Don, um, Don Valley this morning you know, for an hour and a half before coming to my desk at eight. Uh, and, you know, blood's going, I'm pumped, I'm ready to go, I'm doing a live stream today, you know, boom, boom, boom. Uh, um, it gives you that energy so that you can share that energy with your team. Oh, I love that. So you do this like rain or shine as well, like even in the winter time? Yeah, you know, I filmed uh, my phone uh, during the, the snowstorm. I went out, it was horrific. Uh, I wanted to turn around, but I didn't. And then there's something to be said, you know, about being comfortable with being uncomfortable. And so those elements really took a toll on me. All I wanted to do was go home, take a hot shower, but I did. It's kind of like the pandemic. You know, it's it's not, you know, hasn't gone away. It's still there. You know, it's been 14 months, and I, every single day I want to turn around and go, I'm, you know, this is enough. But you keep going. Yeah. You deal. You're. I'm very comfortable being uncomfortable. Wow, I love that. How to stay true to your core values and purpose during uncertainty? Yeah, I think uh, framing it uh, is key. And uh, I wish I could have logged in to see your other speakers. They look amazing. They probably talked something similar uh, or not. Um, but I have this rule, uh, rule of uh, thirds. And this really grounds me in terms of purpose. Uh, you know that one third of the time is gonna be great. Like vaccination, the first day we had vaccines was amazing. Like joy, tears, applause, it was a momentous occasion. You get another third of the time that it's okay. Like today's okay, I'm tired. Uh, we got a lot of issues to deal with, but you know, I'm good. And then you know a third is just gonna suck. Um, like just suck in that wave one, it, there was about six weeks there. I couldn't see our way out, you know, it was horrible. But in the great times, you develop that confidence. It's like, oh yeah, the good times are rolling, you're rolling, oh, you're on top of the world. Sustaining it is like, okay, I can keep going, you know, it's good. And in the crappy times, that's the time where you develop that resiliency, you develop the problem solving ability, you rally other people to your cause, I think it's that last third is where real growth happens. So mm -hmm. if your life, if we didn't have the pandemic, I think most of uh, what we do here at Kensington would be in the first two thirds. But because we went through the crappy third, I know that top third now is going to be amazing. Like it's mm -hmm. going to blow the roof off because we have dealt with the worst, crummiest third of of uh, of our our time. So. That these threes, these thirds, really ground what I do and know that it's going to be great, 
But when it's great, you know it's going to suck at some point. And when it sucks, you know it's going to be good at some yeah. point. So having that balance really keeps you on the straight and narrow. I love that. I love that. And as a leader, how do you, I guess, communicate or motivate your, your staff as well? Like, you know, during these times, like what's what's your messaging and positioning to them? Yeah, I am. A, I like walking. <laughs> I like being active. I can't sit at my desk. So. Um, I don't, I'm doing it less. I was doing it less uh, uh, during wave two, but wave one, I was on the floor doing quiet hallway conversations with uh, some of the most important people that are unrecognized, the housekeepers who are cleaning the floors, you know, sterilizing the knobs and so on, cleaning up the, the, the used uh, PPE, really connecting with everyone. So from housekeepers to our personal support workers, to our nurses, our physicians, our corporate staff is really spending individual time. It's very time consuming, but I think it's time well spent to connect on an individual level to say, I know what you're going through, but thank you. Thank you for what you do. You're making a difference. You don't think you're making a difference, but you're making a difference. And here's why. And you know, I would spend coming Sunday nights because usually the weekend uh, uh, evening shift is often ignored. Like that's the graveyard shift. But I would come in purposely and they'd be like, oh my God, John's here. <laughs> it's <was> like, surprise. <laughs> um, but it wasn't there to check up on it. It was just to make sure, hey, you good? Are you good? Okay, good. You know, so I think that personal touch really does go a long way. That's amazing. Um, I want to go into, I guess, for those who are looking to get into leadership opportunities, and I know you talked about um, in your career is unexpected as well, like how to prepare for or position yourself for unexpected leadership opportunities. Yeah, you know, I, I just caught the tail end of your previous speaker and uh, you know, it's some of what she said resonates like, uh, I never had a plan. <laughs> Uh, you know, I didn't plan to go to business school. Uh, you know, I did my undergrad in marine biology, uh, and you know, here I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think it is really um, rolling with it. I think that's the theme you're starting to hear is, yeah, I wanted to do something that had impact, but I didn't kill myself for the title, the salary, um, the organization necessarily. I think I was more focused, and I still am, very much on skills and competencies. And every uh, every couple of years, I kind of look at, you know, oh, the six competencies that I wanted to master, I think I've mastered, like I have a sense. And then you, you clear the slate, and you put in some six new other competencies. So this is continued growth uh, around that. So when unexpected leadership opportunities present themselves you've got this wealth a, a deep well of competencies drawn some of the things during the pandemic i had to reach really deep to like coming straight out of uh business school my first job like skills that i forgot i had and really had to uh, you know drill down to understand that human element um, mm -hmm easy as a consultant to kind of just gloss over it and drive to that deliverable or as the CEO, oh, not my job description kind of thing, but I actually yeah. have right in. So you develop that, that, that stacking of competencies and all of a sudden you're well equipped to deal with any uncertainty, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's another crisis, stock price drop, earnings per shares, hit a new low, new funding announcement, merger, acquisition, you can handle it. Yeah, yeah, uh, I love this. So final question, um, what's your final advice on managing advancing your career? What can one start doing now? I think if you do good, good things will happen to you. And I'm not saying not-for-profit's better than the for-profit, it's not that. I think you can do good in for-profit, uh, you know, but I think it's also being good to yourself being true to who you are and not try to be something you're not. Uh, if you want to go in that direction, you're saying, oh, this is not me, you know, then how does it become you? Like, what's that journey you're going to take to get to over here, even though you're, it's not about you? And I think that's, uh, you know, kind of how uh, I approach my own career. You wouldn't believe I'm actually a huge introvert. 
Like I am a EFNJ, uh, so a little mixture of extrovert, more introverted. And to do this five, six years ago, this with you, Diana, I would have yeah. blind. I would have said, no, thank you. Right. So now six years on, you develop that confidence. I don't like doing these things, but I also see the value and it gets me out of my own sort of shell and I'm much more comfortable now than I was say five years ago to do this. So um, mm -hmm. I think it's again, stacking up your competencies, really looking at growing personal growth. Don't, there's no cap to your growth. Mm, no no cap. cap to grow. Yeah, there are, your, your, your potential is limitless. And if, with that mindset, you can do anything. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love how you wrapped it up. There's no cap, your potential is limitless. Thank you so much, John. Um, you can follow John on LinkedIn or on Twitter. And thank you so much for your time and insights today. I really appreciate you as well. By the way, I'm an ENFJ. <laughs> You are? I am an EMJ, but I also need my alone time. Like after this, um, I'm actually going to get my vaccine shot and I'm going to need my own time just to decompress as well. <laughs> totally understand. I'm with you on that. Thanks, yeah. Dad, for inviting me. Thank nice you so much. You take care. Bye now. Wow, that was so good to have a conversation with John. I'm so grateful because I know he's just been super busy as well. So we have our final speaker of the day. Are you guys excited? <laughs> type in, let's type in go Sai here. We have our final speaker. I'm super excited to chat with Sai. Uh, Sai Dedfar is the SVP of finance at Point Click Care. Um, she is an executive leader recognized consistently for bringing operational perspectives to financial decisions in fast paced, transforming organizations. She's led teams through innovative and complex change projects in publicly held venture capital, private equity, and owner managed private ec entities within technology, media, communications, retail, and travel sectors. She's a culture and change advocate focused on people and teams. She's, she's, she's elevated contributions of individual players, develop accountability across all levels, and motivate teams to achieve stretch goals. Are you guys excited to welcome Sai to the stage here? Type in go Sai. All right, let's welcome her. Hi Sai, how are you? Hi. Hi, let's test first if everybody can hear me. Can you hear me? It's perfect. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, uh, I was. Perfect. I caught the tail end of uh, John speaking. Wow. Uh, I wish I had not been uh, booked for earlier. So uh, <laughs> ex excited to see the recap later. Yes, definitely need to check out the recap. So thank you so much for being here. And I'm so glad I got to finally connect with you. Um, I know we met on LinkedIn, I think just a couple of months ago through another mutual connection. And I've you know started following your work as well. I love like seeing your posts on, on, on LinkedIn there. And I was just saying the other day to continue to share, to share your voice and message. I loved that encouraging message you sent this morning. So thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Let's start off with some rapid fire questions. Um, what's one thing most people don't know about you? I'm a mom of two. I think a lot of folks hear from me uh, related to sort of professional endeavors, but uh, that's probably something that doesn't come up as as much on social media. It comes up sometimes. Nice, nice. I got two little ones as well. What fulfills you? Uh, I, I'm actually an extrovert, so being around other people, I think that uh, is what fulfills me. So you can imagine the last little while has been hard for a lot of us extroverts. Yeah, for sure. And this is why I do shows like this, because I want to connect with real human beings as well. <laughs> that connection. I hear you. What's your superpower? So I had to think about this one. You gave us some some good thought starters. I think for me, uh, it's the ability to read a room. Again, it's something that's a little bit harder over Zoom, but uh, I can usually guess at what people are not saying. Um, so I think that's um, that's probably the one that I've relied on the most of my life. Nice. And what does success and happiness mean to you? Balance, uh, which I think is a word that we're all thinking of uh, a lot more uh, lately. And balance, of course, means different things uh, to different people. But I've noticed even just that concept is different throughout it, the stages of life that I've had. So in my 20s, it meant something different than it does now. I think 
now it's the ability to just be able to stay in the moment, uh, whether it's at work or uh, related to kind of uh, anything to do with family. I think that one uh, is a big top of mind topic for me. Yeah, I resonate with that too. So let's talk about your cultural upbringing. Tell us a little bit about your story and uh, what's one cultural value that had an impact on you? So uh, first of all, thank you for including me. I was so honored uh, you reached out. I think I replied to uh, your uh, your message uh, or the, one of the postings that you had just with how honored I was to take part. So I should have started out with that. Um, in terms of cultural upbringing, I'm Persian Canadian. So uh, that uh, goes back, uh, I think, 30 years now. So this, this is the 30th uh, anniversary of our immigration to Canada. I'm 40. Uh, so the first 10 years of life, I, I lived in Iran. Um, and so I share, I feel I share quite a lot of uh, experiences uh, with uh, immigrants at various, various stages of, uh, you know, coming to Canada. So um, in terms of, you know, what I, I feel has um, impacted the, the type of leader that I've become as a result of the cultural influences, I think that's what you're getting at with this question. Um, the one quality that jumps out at me a lot uh, that I, uh, took from childhood. I think it's this concept of playing host. I think uh, being Persian, and I think it actually shows up in a lot of different cultures, but I know for me, that's something that um, I learned at a really young age, the idea of being a gracious host. And I think it's translated into how I see my role as a leader uh, to bring, to give enough space uh, to others to express ideas, but to also know that you know as a host you you know you have to play a little bit more of an active role um, in making that happen and so from a, a, a social meets professional perspective i think this has been actually a really great uh cultural um heritage piece that has helped in me absorbing uh the role that i that, that i play I, I know again just on the pandemic theme again it's it's been harder to translate that but i've been thinking a lot lately about how do you do that in a uh, in a remote space to make sure that you're making room uh as much as uh, as you can or the way that you used to translating our in-person personas into what we're becoming online that's a, such a great uh insight like topic here it got me thinking how um you talk about being a host um, I started last year facilitating like group networking events, bringing in like 40, 80 people to a room and then we do breakout rooms. And, and I love it as a host and the facilitator because I just love seeing the energy and dynamic of, of people after they leave the, the, the session there. It takes a lot of skill. I think you're, you're good at it. So you've, you've certainly given a lot of thought uh, to that. Uh, but I think it takes skill to really be able to bring that same energy that we sure. have um in our uh you know at home spaces or in office uh spaces to this online space but i can certainly tell even just in this interaction that you have uh you have that skill uh, <laughs> i thought about being a wedding planner before i became a coach <laughs> transferable skills right Transfer exactly you're right <laughs> Um, what's one challenge that you encountered in your life or career due to your race uh how did that impact you so I don't know that this is necessarily an ethnicity based thing, but I will say that I think emigration in general, I, it's uh, it can, it's a, both a challenge and an opportunity, I think, for a lot of folks. Um, so for me, I think just that concept of having come from a culture where I, w I never even thought about minority status, you know, you were you, you just were what you were. You never really thought about your identity. Um, to moving uh, a, a little bit later in life, uh, you know, old enough, I was a teenager, you know, those years where you're the most obsessed with your, uh, how you appear to other people. So that was an interesting stage of life to really think about this idea of identity. What are you, um, you know, uh, what does that mean uh, to um, both to yourself, but to others? Um, so I thought that was a big one for me, and and it goes beyond just the challenges of thinking through, you know, what what, um, you know, whether what, what you look like or how you appear. It, it actually has some um, other challenges, like linguistic challenges. I learned English when I was uh, ten, uh, from scratch, and uh, really thinking through um, the I, the concepts around confidence that come from losing the ability to communicate, right? And I think in, a, in, a, in retrospect, that's actually been a gift in itself because I think it's added to 
my ability to whether read a room, think about what people are not saying. Um, I'll share a story just really yeah. quickly. This is uh, fairly unscripted, but uh, my husband uh, is uh, Anglo-Canadian. And so we were on an airplane once and somebody was asking him, they were Italian, uh, we were flying back from Italy and they were asking him for help with a form. And he kept going back with, okay, here's what you do. And he was speaking quite quickly. And I kept saying to him as he handed the form back, oh, I don't think you covered the, you know, what she needed. And he kept saying to me, no, no, she's completely fine. She looks like she understands. She's not asking any questions. And then two minutes later, she would go and tap us again to ask for more, uh, in, you know, instruction or help. And so I realized, I, you know, even just this, it's a gift uh, to be able to have had that experience earlier in life where you listen to what people don't say. Um, mm. so yeah, I realized that experience in itself has been uh, has been helpful. That's such great uh, perspective, I would say. I, I feel like I have that too because growing up back and forth in Hong Kong, Canada, that I'm able to see sometimes like what's not said or maybe if someone understands or not as well and to to, to be more curious about it, to, to seek to, to understand them first before I try to explain myself. That's uh, that's great perspective there. Yeah. yeah, and I do think a lot of cultures are actually quite subtle in in uh, more subtle than we are in North America around what you know listening in for what yeah. o- others may not say. So I think it's it's a transferable skill for sure. It becomes a gift yeah. when you're uh, in cultures where that doesn't just naturally develop throughout our childhoods. That's true. So let's talk about your career. Uh, what's interesting about what you currently do? So I, I work in finance. That means that uh, I get I look at my role as a, a storyteller. So I get to tell stories with numbers. Um, and that, I think, as I've gotten more senior in my career, that way of looking at my role, I think that has become uh, more and more truly what uh, what my job is. So that part of my role, I really do enjoy, whether it's, uh, you know, t- and, and, and whether it's talking to internal audiences or even external investors, I think uh, that way of thinking about the role has come in handy. Uh, the other thing that I'm working on a lot as I've gotten further along in my career is transformation, really explaining um, and walking through change with different audiences. I think that uh, has come with, uh, John explained the, the thirds. I really uh, completely yeah. um, relate to that, that idea that um, you know a third of your job is really, really hard. Um, but transformation, I think uh, absolutely, that ties in very well to that. You've got your highs, the days where you're like, wow, there's just no way we could have done, done this or achieved this without the heavy lift. And then there's the days that it's really hard. <laughs> Um, yeah. And then the in between days, right? So um, I love that part of my job, and I think uh, more recently I've actually sought opportunities in finance that are in transforming organizations, whether that's growth or there's some difficult problems to walk through. Um, I've welcomed that. Yeah, yeah. Um, what have been some of the highs and lows in your career journey? What have been the lessons learned here? So the highs for me are often, uh, actually the highs and the lows are often people uh, uh, oriented, right? So uh, seeing others be able to get to past a milestone that they had for themselves. I think that is, uh, if I had to pick one reason that I, um, you know, uh, get up in the morning, it's really just seeing others uh, tackle things or just get through stages that I knew were big milestones for me. So that's, that's big. Um, on the flip side, the, the days that have really been hard, I think transformation involves some decisions that are hard in some environments, right? So I think um, if I'm really true to, you know, what are the myself and just what are the days that um, are hard to get through, it's when when you realize you have to make changes and changes always have uh, people implications. And it isn't necessarily always related to, um, you know, eliminating roles. It could also just be about changing roles where you know somebody is is really more connected to the work they were previously doing, but the organization needs something different. So um, yeah, both the highs and lows for me are on the people side. Mm, Nice, yeah, people challenge are always hard to to tackle, I have to say. Um, What are your guiding principles in managing and advancing your career? The biggest one I think is to 
pay attention to what's needed, right? So, I mean, you can do that, uh, you know, if you're interviewing, you obviously would be trying to do that ahead of entering into a role, but even beyond that, because organizations change with time and uh, change and transformation is a lens that I've, uh, I've worn uh, for at least the last five to seven years of my career. So for you to be effective in the roles that you have, it's really important to try to identify the bigger picture of what's happening in the org. So that way you can be far more proactive about um, bringing out the parts of your toolkit that apply to a scenario um, versus reactive and, and just you know being affected by the changes that are happening in, in your organization. And that's something that I realized um, at, you know, at about, let's say, seven to eight years ago, that that was a unique lens to say, okay, there's always a bigger picture reason why change is happening. I'm going to try to figure out what that reason is and what the other implications might be. Um, and it, it's been easier to assert myself as a leader having that lens versus, okay, I'm doing this and I'm either happy or I'm unhappy about the work <laughs> that we're doing. It's been, uh, it's been helpful to have that lens. Yeah, that's great to hear that. So let's dive into your topic more on leveraging calculated career risks. Um, how have you leveraged uh, calculated career risks to advance your career? So I'll talk about kind of the the pivot uh, moments yeah. in my career, because I think those are the areas where I've used calculated risks the most. Um, I think knowing when to enter organizations, uh, or at least trying to make, make some educated guesses about when to enter organizations or even when to leave for your own uh, career advancement. I think that's an important topic, being able to uh, assess that. Um, for me, and I apologize, I just lost, uh, give me one second, I just lost uh, an, an earbud. Can you hear me still? Yeah, give me one second. I'm back. Can you hear still? Yeah. Okay. No. Thank you. Thanks for bearing with that. Uh, going back to your question, sorry, can you repeat that one? Yeah, how you leveraged your career, um, calculated career risk okay. to advance your career. So you're going to tell yes. some stories. Yeah. So on the pivot moments, I think uh, for me, one of the biggest pivots was actually after uh, Matt leave with, uh, you know, either of my kids actually. Um, I ended up, I ended up taking on opportunities at a time when I realize a lot of women um, will not necessarily prioritize a change. And, and so for me, really understanding that change comes regardless of whether you join an organization new um, or you go back to a role that you've already had, often organizations have changed quite a lot um, regardless. And so I realized for me that that was a differentiating factor, being able to wrap my head around that change concept um, and feel a little bit more in control of it versus um, feeling, again, affected by it. I think that uh, those two pivots, I think they, they uh, stand out for me. Um, and I was often told that I was kind of doing the opposite of what everybody else thinks about doing at, at those stages. And I, I recognize, you know, those, those calculated risks, they're different for diff uh, different folks. Um, and so, um, you know, seizing the moment, and this is happening again, so I'm just going to ignore that one. Um, but seizing the moment is, a, is an important one. Can you hear me still? I just want to double check just to make sure. I might actually have lost uh, sound in me, uh, so can you yeah, still hear? Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, it's perfectly clear. Okay. It's perfectly clear. Yeah, it's perfectly clear. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I'll stop there, but I think just being able to um, identify the right moments uh, right. And uh, the you know the uh, and 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 the fact that those right moments have to be right for you. They're not necessarily right for everybody. So you're going to hear noise, um, but being able to listen to yourself for um, the best outcomes, I think that that was uh, quite crucial for me. And I, as time has gone on, I've started to realize that you know listening to that gut is much more important than listening to what the pack might say is the right thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious, just to build on this is when you think back of your career journey, because you've had multiple leadership roles, 
Um, and oftentimes I hear from people that I, I'm leaving because I've hit a plateau or I'm leaving because there's not much growth or what are some things that you would look for? Like when, when you think about it's time to leave, is it because you feel like you've, you've done your job and it's time to get on, take on more challenging opportunities or. Um, I, I think there's different, um, different answers to this. So I'll kind of answer it from my perspective. I think yeah. there have been moments and this has not been the reason for my exits uh, at every turn, but there have, there are moments when we realize that, um, and we realize this often as leaders as well um, uh, on the other side, that the level of energy that we're bringing to the role and the level of positivity that we're bringing to a role that that has been tapped, you know, tapped out. And that could be coming from our own uh, situations at home, the voices in our head, or it could be actually motivated by something that's happening at work um, around transformations that maybe we're not on board with. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think recognizing that voice of, you know, am I able to bring my best self to this job? I think that's really important, right? Because um, if you follow that principle, um, I think you will know, and that's a balance, right? Because you won't, you always have to look at, you know, am I motivated by the right things? Is the grass actually going to be greener on the other side? And sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't, right? And it's something that we have to figure out. Uh, I'm checking again. Can you hear me? Okay, yep. perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So yeah, so I think uh, having a good sense of what that looks like for ourselves is really, really important. Those principles. Yeah. 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 And let's talk about that. Those limiting voices. How do you really push past those limiting voices in our heads and how to really trust yourself? And I feel like I hear this a lot this past year because with the pandemic that there's so much uncertainty that it's hard to trust our, ourselves because of there's so many things going on. Like what advice do you have for, for, for people who are going through that change right now or navigating? The most important thing I would throw out related to this concept is to recognize that those limiting voices are actually there for everyone, mm -hmm. right? And so if we assume that we're the only ones that have this voice and every other successful person out there has none of it, then the voices actually can take over even more, right? Mm -hmm. For me, the biggest um, breakthroughs that I have when I hear the limiting voices is when I recognize and, and when I really truly step back and say everything that I know from you know the other folks that I've interviewed, successful people that I admire, is that they too have this voice. Therefore, the fact that it's there doesn't mean that I'm going to automatically fail. Um, I think that's been a really important uh, one for me as I think about talking to that voice. Yep. And and then you realize when you do that, the kind of voice in your head that says, you know, regardless of whether you fail or you succeed, you deserve a chance. And I think listening to that kinder voice that's inside your head is really, really important. Being able to um, really normalize the fact that yes, you are taking risks, but this is what risk feels like and being uncomfortable is actually a good thing. Um, and that in itself is a breakthrough, right? Allowing yourself to be uncomfortable uh, and telling yourself that that's okay, this is a good thing. Yeah, I love what you said because it's a balance. It's okay to recognize that negative voice, but it's like also having that kind voice as well that we need to also remind ourselves, I feel like oftentimes when we have so much pressure on ourselves, we tell ourselves that oh, we're not good enough or I can't do this, but we also need to have the other voice. But like, hey, like what are the possibilities here? Or what's the potential here that you are enough? And that encouraging voice, I feel like that's what I do a lot as a coach and encouraging my clients. Yeah, and building that voice up to be our own cheerleader. I think there is also this concept of surrounding yourself with others that will recognize the value in you. but. I think the most successful people are the ones that actually are kind to themselves and they're kind in that they're actually giving themselves room to, to fail also. Right. Cause I, I recognized in the way that I treat myself that it doesn't mean I'm not scared when I'm on yeah. new territory. It just means that I'm okay with the idea of potentially failing. And yeah, that might will not feel good, but even just being out there, being in the ring that that's, far more important for my growth 
than yeah. having the gold star every single time. Because if I have the gold star every single time, I've recognized that means that I'm actually not really in the ring. I'm only there when I have, you know, guarantees that everything's going to work out. Yeah, and that's so important. I love what you just said. That's being in the ring, but knowing that it's okay that it doesn't work out, that it's okay to fail, and that's part of the the lesson and growth uh, there. I, I love that. Yeah, it's easier said than done. I recognize because anytime, <laughs> anytime the failures happen, you're like, well, you know, this is what the let's call it the one third. Okay, yeah, <laughs> exactly, like. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To yeah, you know, what leadership philosophies differentiate you as a leader that others want to be around? Um, I think the concept of followership is really, really important. And it's something that um, I I wouldn't say I've stumbled into. It's something that I give a lot of thought to. And I think it's important to recognize what, what people will take away from your leadership and to, to start to view yourself as uh, you know, as others view you, kind of give yourself that uh, perspective. And so, for me, especially as time has gone on, I think a lot about not just you know current employees. What do they think of me? I actually give a lot of thought to you know um, even folks have whether they've left the teams or I've left the teams. What is my brand out there, and is it based on truly what my values are? Um, and so I give a lot of thought to that. Um, and I think it's it's a proactive thing to be thinking through that um, rather than just, you know, when an issue comes up, you just you react. Right. And I, I often go back to this compass of, you know, if I have an opportunity to um, come through for someone, whether it's a positive or a negative scenario, I I think often about, you know, what do I want this person to take away regardless of the circumstance uh, about my values? And I conduct myself in that manner to, uh, to um, make sure that I'm proud of whatever it is that they take away. Again, the circumstances that people will remember you, a lot of them are often not positive circumstances, right? But if people can remember you in uh, a high integrity way, uh, even in negative circumstances, I think that's that's much more powerful for your ability to, whether it's attract talent, whether even just rehire people. I think that's a really, really important um, topic that yeah. I give thought to. Yeah, that's a great advice there. So my last question here is, how does diversity and inclusion give businesses an edge for higher performance? So I think the topic that doesn't often uh, get absorbed about diversity or DNI is that Diversity and inclusion often is the lens that you bring diversity of thought into organizations. So it actually has a lot of business value. It's not just a feel good kumbaya uh, type of uh, an initiative. It actually, and, and there's a lot of research out there that um, shows this, you know, organizations like McKinsey who've written on this topic uh, purely from a business performance sense. And um, there's a lot more conversation around this now. Uh, but that diversity of thought is exactly what helps you break through problems that you have not traditionally broken through with. And diversity of thought brings you different ways of looking at problems. We all look at problems differently. You, you put 10% in a room and you ask for solutions and even just to describe the problem, people will do that differently. And so if you have too many folks in a room that all think very similarly, you lose that ability and you lose that advantage. Yeah, that's so true. Diversity of thought, like seeing things from a different angle, right? Different perspective. That's really helpful there. So what's your final advice um, for managing and advancing your career? This one, I thought just to sum it up, the most important thing is take matters into your own hands, right? Nobody else is going to uh, manage your career for you. I think earlier on in our careers, most of us assume something great is just going to happen if you just keep your head down and you do grid work. And I think the good work part is table stakes. You have to be good at what you do in order to be noticed. That is absolutely true. So this is not uh, me saying that you don't need to do that. I think that's table stakes. But take matters into your own hands. Pay attention to what um, journey you want to have. And if even if you don't know, take the time to know yourself um, so that you're not disappointed by the years that you put in. Because often you'll find when people are fatigued, with their careers, it's a lot of it has to do with the fact that they haven't taken the time to say, okay, well, where did I want to be? 
um, and what what measurable uh, outcomes show me that I'm on track. Uh, take yeah. the time to do that. Get to know yourself. Um, and there are resources, great resources. You're one of them um, out there that um, can help if 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 you know that's that's tough for you to conceptualize. Yeah, I, I love that final advice there of just taking that time. And, and I'm seeing it more right now, I would say, because of the pandemic, I feel like it just magnifies of people really reevaluating things as well. And, and I'm seeing people who are in work, we're really busy that maybe want to make a change, but don't have the time or space to make that change. And, and I think we really need to take that step back um, to, to evaluate what's truly important to you, what really matters to you to for, for, for fulfillment and happiness there. Yeah, creating enough mental space for yourself. We all deserve it. We all deserve that space. Um, yeah. And I think most of us left to our own devices do not <laughs> take that space um, <laughs> until until we really realize something is off, right? So it, it's it's great to be proactive um, and to think about that. It's a really great investment. Like it, It's probably the biggest one that will pay off for our, our careers beyond just I, the years. Yep, totally agree. So where can people find you, Sai? Um, I write for LinkedIn and you just uh, sent me a note on that. So uh, and if anyone wants to hear thoughts from me, I uh, write somewhat therapeutically uh, as an extrovert. So on LinkedIn is probably the best best place and uh, comments on the posts. Yes, amazing. Yes, please continue to write. I was just thinking, I was going to tell you, like, I don't see that many executives writing and you're a great example. So I know I'll be sharing um, your, your profile with others as well. And it's just a great way to inspire others. But I think right, right now what we're talking a lot is just sharing your story, sharing your voice, sharing your message as well, um, as we all have a unique perspective out there. Thank you again for having me. This was lovely. My, my pleasure. You have a great weekend. Take care. Bye, Sai. Bye. Wow, what a day. Oh my goodness, we just completed six back-to-back -back fireside chat interviews for the Amplify Asian Voices series. I had a blast. I hope you guys had a blast as well. For those who are here, type in still that I'm here. <laughs> Thank you for being with me for the entire show here. Uh, we learned so much today. I'm gonna quickly do uh, a recap of lessons for those who have maybe jumped in a bit later or couldn't catch the, whole sh uh, the entire show. So I'm gonna give you some key lessons uh, take away from today's uh, series there. So first speaker, we had Esther Park on um, uh, stopping someone you're not. And we talked about the importance of um, asking for help to, to reach out when you need it. Um, I love the model that she said, the to TOMO, um, total mot motivation on around play, purpose, potential, and finding career happiness there. Um, learning to fail, that it's okay to, to fail, um, and that it's a journey, not a destination when it comes to managing your career. And their second speaker, Angie Minha Park, who um, she is uh, currently completing her PhD in Asian studies at York University. She talked about the importance of seeking uh, your truth when pivot pivoting. And she talked about the message around do it your own way, right? Uh, like what, what, is, uh, what is it that you really want? Trusting your gut there. Uh, find support system uh, and mentors. Uh, finding unique ways to speak up as well and sharing your story and experiences. Uh, ask questions. And our third speaker was Tanya Dessa, who's the CEO of Dessa Global Leadership. Um, her topic was secrets to owning your awesomeness. And I love her energy. She talked about really finding your voice, how the importance of really um, owning your awesomeness, right? To, to talk about it and have a success file there to celebrate your wins along the way. Giving yourself grace, you know, during times of challenges and difficulties as well. Um, and really owning your story. I think that it's so important to you to talk about our story, to talk about our journey as well for uh, others to, to learn. And, and don't forget to raise your hand when it comes to uh, asking for more for a promotion. And then our last speaker, Cindy Wong, who is the head of marketing communications at the Cooperators. Um, she talked about, um, you know, not qualified, just go for it. That was her talk. And I love that she has just this amazing career journey, uh, it's a very successful career journey, having worked at HSBC, being recognized as a um, marketer of the year and um, one of the Canada's top 100 most powerful women. She talked about do what scares you. That's like her guiding principle in, in life there to be ambitious, to know your brand 
presence, right? Of what you stand for. What's the impression that you want to leave? How do you really want to make others feel there? Uh, to be adaptable in different situations as well. Like if, when you move into different environments or roles, you got to be adaptable and versatile. Um, and then the other is like, if you want to get, um, promote it to an ex executive level position is to act like you already have a seat at the table, right? Bring your best self, bring your A game there. And then we have John Yip, who talked about um, leading um, with purpose in a pandemic. I loved his stories that he shared as well. Um, I talked about the importance of having a support system and to create uh, conditions for good luck when it comes to um, advancing your career, being empathetic as well, and really understanding the challenges that people are going through. Taking care of yourself is really important. I love that he he's a triathlete and he has a, a, a run every run every street project there. Um, and being comfortable with the uncomfortable in uncertain situations. You gotta consistently or constantly put yourself out there even though when you're scared. Um, and to add, also add a personal touch um, in getting to know people as well, to show them your appreciation, your gratitude as well. And then lastly was uh, Saeed Farr, who is the SVP of Finance at Point Click Care. She talked about leveraging calculated career risk. And it's important to really understand the big, bigger picture of things, of where you're heading and what you want, taking risk, seizing the moments as well, bringing your best self to work as well. Um, and I love what she said, being in the ring, like, you know, if you want a seat at the table that you ought to, you know, be, be part of that, being in the ring to 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 showcase your, your, your value there. And then lastly is having diversity of thought that will help enhance the uh, the workplace performance and culture there. So that's the overall of the day. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Like, what were some of your key learnings? Um, for those who are here, what are some of your biggest learnings? Um, tell me, tell me, like, if you want to type in the chat room before... We go here. I see some of you still here. Uh, Linda, thank you for being here. Thank you so much uh, there. Um, Andrea, oh my goodness, you're still here. Andrea, what fantastic conversations. Thank you to all the speakers. Congratulations, Diana, thank you. Thank you so much for your support, guys. I hope you guys enjoy this. I'm gonna be adding uh, timestamps to my YouTube channel there. And if you guys want to know what, um, the next uh, round of speakers for next week, go just go check out my website at mymarkability.com forward slash events. You will see the upcoming uh, speakers there. Let me see if I can do a quick screen share here. If I can find that, yes, of my speakers next week. Here are my speakers that I have for next week. We have, um, let me see here. Yes, Jean Kim, who is a co-founder of uh, Live Their uh, Potential. Angie Kim, VP National Operations at Loblaws. Uh, Ivan Lee, who is a DEI practitioner and senior program manager in learning development at T-Mobile. Daniel Young, who's my former mentor at TELUS, director of customer experience strategy and operations. And lastly, Tej Singh Hazra, who is a client partner of Global DEI Solutions at Corn. Very. So these are our speakers for next week. I hope you guys will join me there. It's going to be an amazing fireside chat conversation there. Um, uh, so yeah, just feel free to check out my uh, upcoming events on my website, or you can just uh, you know follow me on LinkedIn to to stay tuned for there. Okay. And for those who would like some more free resources, feel free to check out my website at mymarkably.com forward slash resources. I have resources on career clarity networking and interview prep. So if you need a bit of help, feel free to check that out or come on over to my YouTube channel where I have tons of free resources and videos as well. I just had um, a super fan of mine as a student who messaged me a couple of weeks ago how she watched all my videos on YouTube to help her land a job in one of the top tech companies that allowed her to um, increase her salary by 50%. And it was so touching. She wrote me such a lovely testimonial um, that you can find on my LinkedIn there. Um, so yeah, so definitely check out my free resources to help you advance your career. So thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you guys. And I hope you guys have an amazing weekend and stay safe as well. All right, you take care. Bye now. Thank you.